Did you really? What, what was the big? Calling the um, October 26, 2018 Board of Directors meeting of the Santa Cruz Metropolitan uh, Transit District to order in this lovely city of Capitola. Mr. Bottorf has welcomed us with open arms. Welcome <laughs> to our humble abode. Uh, we will, uh, first of all, I, well, uh, we can we can take a roll call. Let's, let's swear in our first, our, our new ex officio member. Alta Norcutt, Yay. if we would, uh, you would you please take yep. the honor, make uh, do the honors, please. Gina, do you care where we are? <laughs> nope, just as maybe right over there. The so you do it. care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but get over here. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I would suggest. <laughs> Is it on camera? Yes. You want to be right in the front there? Oh, the camera's there. right there. Me, well, get, we'll get, you want us to get on the camera? Right, 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 right in the middle. The camera's right, right the there. there. Okay. Oh, over there. Yeah. Okay. Why do I know? <laughs> okay. And look that way. She has some no, but Ed cares. A couple of announcements. Uh, Carlos Landaveri will uh, introduce his Spanish language interpretation. Good morning, Carlos. How are you? Good morning. Buenos dias. Doing well. Thank you for asking. Carlos Landaveri, your interpreter. Para las personas que prefieren español o necesitan traducción al español, voy a estar en la parte de atrás. Thank you very much. Gracias. Okay. Uh, we have. Do we have any um, board of director comments? Um, that, uh, items that are not on the agenda. Yes, Mr. Hagen. I would just like to add to the idea that we do need to invest. And I know we're trying, but we need even more so to invest in personnel for the Paracruz drivers. Yeah. There, I came this morning, <coughs> and. I've had this young lady as a driver before, but the pressure that they're in is, I feel, and I know you do too, Alex, unreal. And I told her that I would mention this publicly for her and for all the drivers of Paracruz. She's running on a, every day, 10 and a half hours. And she says, I, I come, I finish very, very tired. And it's beginning to worry her, her as she get, gets to Fridays. So please, 
on their behalf and on my behalf as one of the <laughs> recipients. I'm not a board member now. I'm a right and one of the clients that we have. But please do everything we can to uh, get new drivers, more of them. Thank you. You know, we might actually use this moment, we're on television, to say to the public, we're looking to hire drivers for both Paracruz and for our regular buses. And um, you would think there would be more people lining up for these jobs. They have really good benefits and the pay is really good and uh, they require a high school degree and, and a clean driving record, basically, if I, unless I misunderstand anything. That's really what you need in ability to sort of take the training. But it's a really good job. It's a really good career. And uh, hopefully some members of the public will uh, step up and, and think about uh, working for the district in this kind of job. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clifford. Sure, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, thank you to the two directors for that shout out. We definitely need help. And this is a great venue where we're televised. I will just say quickly, we have that on your agenda today. We'll be giving you a little bit more insight into what we're doing to try to resolve that problem. Thank you. I would like to mention that Mr. Lynn Dunton uh, is the, uh, our technician from Community Television who's uh, televising this uh, meeting today. Do we have any um, oral or written communications from the board that wasn't on the agenda? Uh, from the public, any oral communications of items that are not on the agenda? Okay. Any written communications from the MAC? No. Uh, labor organization communications? Any other communications? Um, okay, we do not have, um, let's see, we have copies distributed. Um, I guess we're I'm supposed to announce that item 12, the Unified Corridor Investment Study today. Uh, we have item 15, we do have some job fair cards that we were just uh, uh, discussing shortly there. A item 17, an oral update on a special board meeting, and item 22, public comments regarding the park and ride receive. We'll get to that. And we have some agenda news clips as well. Um, we will uh, now move to the consent agenda. Uh, there's four items on the consent agenda. Um, is there anybody on the board that would like to comment on items on the consent agenda? Anybody from the public would like to comment on items on the consent agenda? I'll entertain approval a motion. Approval of the consent agenda. Second. Moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? So ordered unanimously. We'll go to item number 11 on the regular agenda, a presentation of employee retirement resolution for Pete Legoretta. Legoretta. Um, he has been with us 1988 to 2018, 30 years. It's, uh, you're here. <laughs> is he here today? Is he, is he, is he, is he, would you come up, uh, just say hello? Uh, we want to see who you are and could you down and present. <laughs> well, uh, Chair, I would move the resolution yeah, oh, in so honor of him. Oh, thank you. We have Second. a motion to approve the resolution to honor him. Um, by me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. uh, Mr. Bottorf and his home city of Capitola were presented to you officially, and uh, yeah. 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 There you go. Yeah. There you go. Wait, there you can go. wave to her. Well, thank you very much for your 30 years, and uh, you could speak from there. Do you have any comments, brief comments that you would like to thank you for your 30 years of service to the Metro? I do. I wasn't able to come when I was celebrating my 30th anniversary. I'm sad about that. And I reflected back, reflected back on my um, my career here with the Metro. I remember I started this place. I was thought it was just going to be a step for me to get an education and then move on to a different job. I didn't realize what an incredible employment opportunity there is here. I've been here 30 years, they've paid me well, they've challenged me, they've given me a nurturing, you know, fertile garden there for my family to, 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 to succeed. We have five bachelor degrees, we have two master's degrees that all my family has, has uh, we've been able to do that because of Metro. Because of Metro, because it gave us the opportunity. If I wanted to work a lot and, and make more money, I could. I was one of those workaholics. Thank you, Manny Martinez. He showed me the way. The man would work all the time. And he told me that you have, if you want to make more, 
the American uh, the dream can be done here. You just got to work more. You think you want to work 40? Well, work 40. But if you want to work more and, and get more, you can do it. And, and so I did. And so I did. Uh, I think back to Judy Souza. I want to thank all the people who have gone before me and, and, and have passed or have retired. And I think about Judy, who, who was so encouraging in everything she did. And she actually uh, made me a supervisor. I was an operator for 15 years and then a transit supervisor for 15 years. And she thought that I was something special. And uh, I, I, I could never see why, but you know what? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, thank you, Bryant. Thank you, Cyril. Thank you, Anna, for your friendship, for letting me sound off on you and telling you what I thought needed to happen and, uh, and taking that in. Thank you to my union memberships, either UTU or SEIU, for working hard, working hard to give us that living wage. Also to the board members, uh, uh, Mr. White, who was an incredible rainmaker. Uh, mm -hmm. Those of us that have been here a long time remember when we couldn't get a raise. I think we went like Larry Manjoli said, look, it's, we haven't had a raise in eight years. And it was tough times because of the earthquake and everything else that happened. And we had to close Watson, which is where I lived, which was three minutes from where I lived. <laughs> and now I had to drive to Santa Cruz, and you guys all know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, once Mr. White came in, it's like, it's like the sky is open. The economy improved. Um, and all of a sudden, uh, we are where we are right now with wages. Uh, we have a living wage here, which I appreciate. And uh, like I said, the challenge you work, everything that's happened for my family, I, I owe all to the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District. Very, very, very grateful to, to all of you, because you always have a continuation of the board. Also, Mr. Clifford took on a very, very tough situation when he came. He's got to make this place to continue to be a going concern, which is what I want. Because all you need is a high school diploma even though I'm on that, you know, back to this place, to, to come in, get trained, become something. You actually can, you know, you gain traction here. You can gain traction here, and if you apply yourself, you can pick yourself up and your family. So thank you all very much thank to you. everybody. Thank you. I think you're the poster child for Metro, okay? Yeah, that was a great yeah. place. I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's our poster guy right there. We're gonna, that's uh, for new drivers. That's great, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the applications can start pouring in. Uh, we also have Ascension Sanchez, uh, 1984 to 2018, 34 years, but he is not here, well, from my understanding. But we want to thank him and we will present him with a resolution as well. Do we need a separate I, motion? Or? Why don't we go ahead? Yeah, yeah I would motion. move both resolutions. Second. Move to second to approve both resolutions. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered. Uh, now we're going to have, I think, a presentation from uh, Mr. Emerson, Barrow Emerson, about the Unifor, uh, Unified Corridor and Investment Study Update. All righty. Good morning, board chair, board members, staff, and public. Um, today we have RTC staff who are involved in the Unified Corridor Investment Study here to give an overview of the current status of the project and the upcoming important dates. Following their presentation, I'll return with just a few words about Metro's perspective on the project and how we will continue to provide input to you, the board, specifically at our November 16th Metro Board Meeting, which will be de the day after the RTC staff makes their staff recommendation to their commission. So until then, we'll keep working with them. It's a pleasure to introduce Ginger Dykar, the UCIS project manager, and her peer, Grace Blakesley from RTC. Thank you, Grace. Good morning, Chair and members of the board and uh, the public. My name is Ginger Dykar. I'm a transportation planner here at the Regional Transportation Commission and project manager for the Unified Carter Investment Study. My coworker, Grace Blakesley, and I will be presenting the draft results of the Unified Carter Study to you today. Uh, there is a handout that was provided for this item. It's a really handy handout to have as we go through our presentation this morning. And I just want to take a minute to thank you for providing this opportunity for us to present the draft results of this study to your board. And also mention that the uh, RTC staff has worked very closely with the Metro during the process of this study with certainly any assumptions and uh, project descriptions that we've made um, with bus transit. 
for every different scenario that we're evaluating transit options. So to get started, the objective of the Unified Corridor Study is to identify multimodal transportation investments on Highway 1, SoCal Avenue Drive and Freedom Boulevard, and the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line to serve the community's transportation needs. I don't think I need to remind you the level of congestion that our residents and visitors and all of us are experiencing on um, our roadways and particularly Highway 1 and SoCal and Freedom. And with the acquisition of the rail right of way in 2012, which has unused capacity, the question has um, come up, how best can we use this rail right of way that provides a parallel transportation facility to Highway 1, SoCal Avenue Drive and Freedom Boulevard? Um, in to address the transportation needs of our community. So as you see here, the project study area map in the Unified Corridor Study, we're evaluating the rail right of way from Davenport to um, Watsonville and beyond to Pajaro Station. We're looking at Highway 1 also from Davenport to the Monterey County line, and then all of SoCal Avenue, SoCal Drive and Freedom Boulevard into the heart of Watsonville. The uh, process for evaluating these transportation improvements are a performance-based planning and a scenario analysis approach. The first um, step was to identify the goals of our study and what performance metrics we would be used in order to uh, determine how best to advance these goals. Uh, all of these steps of this um, pyramid here were approved by our commission over the uh, key milestones, at these key milestones of the project. So the next step after identifying the goals and performance measures were what projects were we going to be evaluating in this study on Highway 1, SoCal Freedom, and the rail right of way. Once these projects were identified, they were grouped into various different scenarios. We first started out with six different scenarios for the step one analysis where we took a look at qualitatively are these scenarios feasible. The step um, one recommendation from staff was approved by the commission in December 2017 to then um, hone down to four different scenarios that were evaluated in the step two analysis to look at a much um, closer look quantitatively at our performance metrics to see how these various different scenarios compare. So again, this is your handout that was provided. Um, it'll help be helpful as we go through the slide, and I will just run through what are the different projects and the various different scenarios. So scenario A, um, the projects there are HOV lanes on the highway, uh, and uh, as a reminder, all three sets of auxiliary lanes that are funded by Measure D are assumed in all of the scenarios. There's already funding programmed for those projects, and so that's underlying all of these scenarios. Scenario A has uh, the full set of HOV lanes on the highway. It has a BRT light on SoCal and Freedom and a trail only on the rail right of way. In scenario B, uh, there is bus on shoulders on the highway uh, and there's also ramp metering in addition to the three sets of auxiliary lanes for Measure D. On SoCal, there's our BRT light, uh, also buffered or protected bike lanes. And on the rail right of way, uh, the assumption in this scenario is passenger rail service as well as a trail. In scenario C, we are looking at bus on shoulders for the highway with the additional set of the th additional three sets of auxiliary lanes, which would bring the auxiliary lane projects all the way down to San Andreas, so the full set from SoCal all the way to San Andreas Road. Um, and then BRT light on SoCal and Freedom, and then on the rail right of way is a bus rapid transit option, as well as a trail. In scenario E, this is the uh, HOV lanes on the highway, buffered bike lanes on SoCal and Freedom, and on the rail right of way is passenger rail, freight, and a trail. Just to go over the go goals real quickly for the project, we looked at safety, reliability and efficiency, environment and health, economic vitality, and equitable access, all based on the triple bottom line of sustainability. The first goal that I want to present to you today is the safety goal. The metric was to look at the number of collisions. For baseline 2015, we, um, the average number of collisions in the project study area is 1,110. If uh, the no build, the, the no build is, um, if you're not familiar with that, that projects out the um, 
what would happen if no transportation improvements were implemented, but population increase and land use um, changes for 2035. And um, let me just emphasize here that our forecast for all the scenarios are a 2035 timeframe. So the no bill because of increased population and therefore increased traffic volumes, number of collisions would increase on the order of 12. 111, um, but with transportation improvements evaluated in the various different scenarios, uh, you'd see a decrease. Uh, what we found here is the uh, ramp metering projects as well as the trail separated from the um, autos for bicyclists and pedestrians, as well as education and enforcement were some of the top um, projects that would reduce the number of collisions. Along with the number of collisions, we also have as a full performance metric the cost of collisions. There's uh, tangible and intangible costs associated with collisions and injuries and fatalities. <coughs> we, uh, as a community, spend about $500 million a year on the cost of collisions. It's substantial. Um, so anything we can do to reduce the collisions um, benefits not only our residents, but also the community and the services that are provided for, the, for um, addressing collisions. Do you want questions as you go along or at the end? Um, I, it's up to the discretion of your yeah, board. Can, you know, I, I don't have the, one. I, yeah. okay. I, have, I, I think it might be smoother up, if it's at the end. Ask. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> we also looked at <coughs> the uh, speed on a uh, on our for our performance measure. This is a reliability and efficiency goal. This is a countywide auto speed. Uh, you can see with scenario A and scenario E with the HOV lanes project, there's a uh, increase, a, a slight increase in the countywide average speed. Um, we receive feedback as we've go been going through and presenting these draft results that this really doesn't tell the picture enough. Um, so we also are providing this um, additional um, information about speeds on Highway 1. I just want to um, clarify that this data is uh, available in the Highway 1 Draft Environmental Impact Report. The, that study was um, took information to a more detailed level in the tools that were available for them. They not only use the travel demand model, but use an additional tool that can really dial into the travel speeds, uh, travel times on the highway. Um, so we don't have a perfect match for all of our scenarios, but the data for scenario A and scenario E with the HOV lanes is fairly representative. So this is on the highway. It's the average speed during a peak hour. This is the northbound AM, and it's between San Andreas Road and um, essentially <coughs> Highway 117, that's, but it, uh, it's right at the Branson 40 over crossing. So now, so my, now my question. You said at the beginning we started with a sort of qualitative analysis of which scenarios sort of were possible or feasible, I think is the term you used. Um, and I'm looking at this chart, and it's listing um, A and E both list HOV lanes. So I, I've gotten calls from people who don't, I don't, they must have just moved here yesterday. That's a, probably an unfair comment, but they, they go, why don't we pick A and E? Look how much faster the traffic moves. Well, because it cost a half billion dollars to do HOV lanes, we tried it and gave up. So wh why was there a decision that we want to present to the public this option of A and E? I might pick A or E if I thought I, we could afford it or that the public would support it, but isn't it, I mean, am I, am I mistaken in thinking that we tried, went, we went down that path, tried it, and it, I'm just trying to figure out, and was, if you understand, if you look at these charts, you think, well, A and E, they look great. All it takes is an HOV lane. Hey, oh, great. Put it in there. Yeah. <laughs> there seems to be a continual conversation in our community about the highway and how to address some of the issues that we're all dealing with. Um, we also have a metric in our um, analysis for the Unified Corridor Study of cost information, okay. and that will be presented by Grace Blakesley. So we're trying to bring all the information together to um, have an informed decision-making process. Okay, so it'll be there, and, and, and people will make a judgment I mean, about whether they think A&E are feasible. You didn't cut. You didn't cut that out at the at the qualitative analysis. You're going to use the uh, the metrics of the cost of it. People will then be able to make a choice based on that. Those that information was the decision that you went with. So, so there is a metric for cost information, and in that the uh, commissioners can make a decision based on um, all of these different metrics, including cost. Thanks. I don't Ginger, uh, could you just say what scenario B plus is? Uh, yes. Um, so. The information in the Highway 1 EIR, as I mentioned, is more detailed 
information on speed and travel times. And that represents a scenario A and E very well. Um, in the, if you recall, in the draft environmental impact report, not only the HOV lanes, but an alternative transportation system management alternative was also presented and evaluated in detail. And that includes all the six, six sets of auxiliary lanes, as well as ramp metering. <coughs> we don't have a, a scenario that is exactly that, and that's where this um, B plus came in. So with scenario B, which has the six sets of auxiliary lanes for measure D, it has ramp metering, and then if you add on the additional three sets of auxiliary lanes, that's what we're, we're calling B plus. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was my high school career, but. The, the, <laughs> <laughs> the reason we didn't present this earlier was because it's tricky. There's a lot of caveats with presenting this information, but we had enough comments from people that they felt we felt like it was important to show the data that is available from the Highway 1 EIR so people can realize the um, benefits of the HOV lanes more directly on the highway. Thank you. Uh, I have a question as well, if that's okay. Um, I don't know if this is for the audio for the TV so that they can hear my question. The EIR, I it's in draft format now? Correct. And where is it available for people to, to review it? Because I haven't seen the EIR, but we're making reference to it in this presentation. So I'd like to see where we have access to taking a look at, even if it's the draft format at this point. It's available on the RTC website and has been since it was um, provided, and I believe it was at least early 2017, if not yeah. prior to that. It's also in our report, referenced in our report. Okay. And that's how we addressed it initially, <coughs> was that the information in the EIR provides the best information on speeds. Thank you. The other, one of the other metrics for the reliability and efficiency goal was to look at the peak period transit travel time. <coughs> this is in the um, PM from four to seven. We looked at um, Santa Cruz to Watsonville for the various different scenarios. Grab a sip of water here. <coughs> um, with the HOV lanes on um, State Route 1, there's, uh, if you look at transit as an express service between Santa Cruz and Watsonville, the time is just a little bit over a half hour. The, um, so that's evaluated in scenario A and scenario E. Scenario B and E are looking at the rail right of way. The travel times are on the order of about 41 minutes. So the, the two um, sets of uh, options, transportation options that provide the fastest transit travel times are the Highway 1 Express service with HOV lanes and the, um, the rail service on the rail right of way. The mode share changed by scenario, so we saw that all the um, scenarios provided an increase in transit, bicycling, and um, walk mode share, and a reduction in single occupancy vehicle as well as carpool. Um, scenario B offers more transit options, and therefore that um, option shows the highest transit mode share. 3% is the um, <coughs> approximately the current amount of transit in our um, community at, a, at the current time, so a, 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 an additional 3% is a doubling of the current um, transit mode share. <coughs> Another metric, this is for the environment goal, is the countywide vehicle miles traveled. Uh, scenario A and E with the HOV lanes has a, a slight increase in the vehicle miles traveled with the capacity increasing projects of the HOV lanes versus scenario B and C, which are um, more operational improvements on the highway. We also looked at the annual transit vehicle miles traveled. Um, you can see that the current baseline is about 3.33 million um, vehicle miles traveled for transit. Um, so in all of the scenarios, we're looking to increase transit by a substantial amount. And scenario B with um, not only rail transit offering uh, transit connections to the rail bus transit to have that um, cross um, east to west distribution and connections to destinations um, shows the largest increase. <coughs> a metric the, uh, that we looked at for our equity goal is the household transportation costs. Uh, what we um, found that the household transportation costs are very much in line with the number of vehicles that people own. 
Um, the typical number of vehicles that people own in Santa Cruz County are two vehicles per household. And every time there's a vehicle, with each vehicle um, that a household owns, it's a, over $5,000 per year. And that's not even if you drive it. Um, the average number of miles that people, that a household puts on is about 21,000 miles per year. So if the household owns two vehicles and drives um, the average amount, then that's about $44 per day. Um, what we found <coughs> that is that there isn't a huge difference in the, the scenarios. Um, the re results, if we, if we uh, the each of the scenarios are evaluated as a two vehicle household, and where you really get the difference is if you provide enough opportunities for people to get around in other ways besides driving their vehicle, so other options that are safe and reliable to allow them to decrease the number of vehicles in their household. Another metric for equity was the share of investment benefit for the transportation disadvantaged population. We have approximately 14% of our population that is transportation disadvantaged. This is um, based on the data that is available to us to look at. It's a uh, income based as well as minority. Uh, and um, for all of the scenarios evaluated, we see a greater benefit to the dis transportation disadvantaged populations than um, the percentage of population in our county. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Grace Blakesley. Good morning, directors. Grace Blakesley, staff to the Regional Transportation Commission. Thank you for having us today. I know we have presented this to many of you. Um, it's a lot of details. It's, it's good that people are diving in, so thanks for having us this morning. This is um, the level of public investment performance measure. It's separated into the capital, into the operating costs. What you see in front of you is the sum of the total capital costs for each of the scenarios. Um, the way that we've calculated the level of public investment is not just presenting the cost, but then also bringing in the anticipated revenues that may be able to be used to fund those costs and showing them, the community and the board, what new public level investment would be required to implement these. So you can see the part that's the darker shade on the bottom is what we think could be funded um, based on uh, revenue assumptions, very consistent with the regional transportation plan and also taking into account new information we have about some of the SB1 competitive funding programs. As you can see, the amount differs between scenario A and scenarios B, C, and E for the funding estimate that's largely due, that is due to um, the additional revenues we anticipate that could be available for rail in these scenarios um, that would not be available in scenario E if there was not a um, rail or bus on a fixed guideway. So that would not be provided in scenario A. Um, as um, Director Rotkin was pointing out, the higher costs um, in um, items and are the HOV lanes as well as passenger rail as well as the trail. So those are some of the bigger cost items in each in, in each of the scenarios. A similar exercise was completed for the annual cost of operations and maintenance um, for each of the scenarios. Um, we were presenting this information on an annual basis. Um, it includes the cost for all new transit services, um, vehicle operations, and vehicle maintenance. It also includes maintenance costs for trail projects, as well as maintenance for bus rapid transit on the um, rail right-of-way in Scenario C. Um, it also in reflects the cost of facility maintenance on state highways, um, although those funds are assumed to be continually allocated by Caltrans, similarly for local jurisdictions. And we did that to try to reflect the, the really the total cost um, to the um, community for operations and maintenance. What's not shown here is what Ginger was mentioning, which is the cost of owning your own vehicle and, and running your own vehicle. Another piece of um, a measure, another measure we used to address the economic vitality goal looked at the overall economic benefits that were provided by transportation improvements. So for each of the scenarios, the Unified Corridor Study evaluates the changes in visitor tax revenue and other economic benefits, um, including impacts on property values, business location decisions, development potential, and business performance. This analysis was conducted by a firm 
term strategic economics that serves as a subconsultant to the Kimmel Hall and team who are working with on this project. In order to conduct this analysis, they really looked at four different items which are listed up on the slide. They look at the area impacted by the transportation improvement, um, who's benefiting from that transportation improvement, if the improvement created a new transportation route, which is um, really relates to the projects that would be within the rail right of way, and then if the creation of a new amenity. And so in this case, we're looking at transportation improvements that would also serve as a visitor attraction. So that would be an excursion, uh, train service, and the trail were both treated that way in this analysis. So for the visitor tax revenue, um, the, the, the metrics that were used was a looking at the transportation occupancy tax and the visitor related sales tax. Um, as you can see, if you see the baseline on the left hand side of the screen, um, that and then compare it to the no build, which is on the far right, that we largely expect that there's going to be an increase in the transit occupancy tax and visitor related sales tax that follows previous trends. And that the transportation improvements would only um, be be responsible for a marginal increase um, in those uh, transportation occupancy and visitor related tax. So am, I am I correct in understanding that, that the no build basically produces as much revenue as the others? There's just a, there is some difference um, called out there, but I mean, j th what you're seeing is that based on historic trends in transit occupancy tax and visitor sales related sales tax, it is going to be the, the other visitor attractions that we have um, that will largely be the moving the needle. So on we, we, we would be doing this if it was to try and draw more visitors, then this has to do with moving people around our county. Would be like that, that's how I interpret that chart. Do I get it right? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think there's still something to be said for an increase from 39 million to, to 40.1. <laughs> I mean, there that's additional revenues that do come to our community that we could use for, for services. So Fair it may enough. be a small amount, but we certainly are always trying to squeeze um, all the money out of our um, and make make the most of all the revenues that we do we do have. Um, but I, I you you do understand. So we are looking at it as the overall access that visitors might have for based on highway improvement changes, um, any changes in use of the rail 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 right of way, as well as those two visitors amenities. And what this is showing is that, or what what strategic economics communicated to us is that they do think people may extend their stay while they're here to um, take the excursion train or visit the trail, and they may have additional expenditures associated with those activities, but by and large, the improvements to the system wouldn't attract new visitors. This table um, really brings together the relative economic benefits of each of the scenarios based on the four categories I mentioned that were evaluated under other economic benefits, and those are shown on the left. Changes in business location decisions, changes in development potential and property values, changes in business performance, local tax revenue, and user benefits. So. One of um, the, with, for, to conduct this analysis, strategic economics looked at the different project level impacts and then translated that into an assessment of the overall relative benefits for each scenario. So for example, improvements that ease access, ease access for businesses would be expected to have an impact on business location decisions. So that would include key highway improvements that might improve access to businesses, jobs, um, uh, services, it would be expected um, a new, I those improvements could attract businesses um, to, that, to that area. The analysis also those associates the most significant change in business location decisions with those projects that include all new transportation options. So you've heard me say this a couple times, but really providing a new transportation option on the rail right of way would help people to access new areas that poten potentially they couldn't access now or they don't access um, easily because of congestion. Access to freight is also expected to influence business decision locations for uses that do rely on freight. And trail projects could also impact project uh, business location decisions due on the due to cluster cu customer serving kind of clusters of businesses. For property values, um, 
Research showed that, again, providing new connections and new access are likely to have the greatest impacts on development and values, so new transit services um, that connect new destinations are expected to have a relatively larger impact on development potential and property values, um, and projects that include improvements to local access, including bicycle and transit facilities, are also expected to have impacts on property values. For business performance, it's largely similar to um, the, the what's considered in the business and location decisions, except um, one difference is related to localized improvements. So intersection improvements in particular um, are associated with improvements in to changes in business performance. Um, local tax revenue and user um, benefits are largely tied to the others. We have been doing a ton of outreach. It's been really great to hear from the community and from the city councils and from our stakeholders and our advisory committees, uh, advisory committee meetings. So we held, um, similar to the step one process, we held a meeting with our stakeholders, which includes representative from city of Capitola um, and Metro. We also um, had our RTC advisory committees, which is our elderly and disabled transportation advisory committee, our interagency technical advisory committee, as well as our bicycle committee. We held two public workshops, one in Santa Cruz and one in the city of Watsonville. They were both very well attended. Um, we're ha we have our presentations to our partner agencies, um, the city councils and Metro. We have the only agency we have not presented to so far is city of Capitola, which was coming up. Um, we also had a board meeting uh, presented to our board at our October 4th and October 18th meetings. Um, we will also have we also had focus group meetings that um, invited members from the business community as well as neighborhood advocacy groups and environmental groups to meet with us and provide their input. We have one more focus group meeting to be held in the city of Watsonville um, on next Tuesday, um, and we've invited a number of folks from the chamber, um, rotaries as well as educators. Um, we pre expect to present our preferred scenario to the Regional Transportation Commission November 15th at a 6 p.m. meeting in the city of Watsonville and ask our board to take action on um, December 6th at 9 a.m. We have received a number of questions on the report, which shows that people are digging really deep, and that's really great. Um, we've prepared a frequently asked questions document to provide responses to those um, questions. Um, we expect to provide another update, if not trying to get one out today, to answer more questions. So please um, encourage people to send us their questions, and if you have questions yourself. Um, we are really asking our, we do expect to ask our board to take action at the December 6th meeting so we can really provide direction to staff um, how to move forward and implement some of the priority projects for this community. Um, we've had questions about deadlines for comments. Um, the thing we'd like to point out is all, any comments anytime are always accepted and any written comments are all provided to our board. Um, in terms of uh, having your comments considered in the process, we'd like to ask people to have their comments to us by November 2nd if they'd like them to be considered in preparation of the preferred the staff report for the preferred scenario. Um, and by November 20th, um, for consideration by staff in the final recommendation on the preferred scenario. And any comments received up until 12th um, noon on December 5th will be provided in written form to our board. Oops. That concludes our, our report. And then we do have our website up here for people who are on TV. Um, please send your email, your email, um, our comments, written comments to UCS at secrtc.org. Uh, Director Dutra. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. This is the second time I've heard it, so um, I just have a few questions because you guys did answer a lot of the other questions in a follow-up email that we had, so thank okay. you. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, I, uh, mine are going to, the three questions that I have are, are related around um, transit and uh, the buses. So when the last time we spoke, when you guys came to speak to the city of Watsonville, um, I think it was I think it was you, Grace, that said we were going to increase the um, the bus routes um, coming to because you're going to have to work the bus routes with the train system, and um, I know and I and I said then you know we we were faced with a fiscal cliff and we had to really kind of cut back a lot and to scale back um, with you know our our um, frequencies and um, you know we did have to uh, um, eliminate some routes. With um, what Metro, the bus, what we faced with our bus situation, um, and I guess this question may be towards Alex, is it feasible that um, we will have the funding to um, increase all the routes that will be needed to 
um, work with a rail? I, I think the answer to that is to be determined. I think through this process, they, um, if, if rail, for example, is the, the choice, um, we would move into a, a stage or, I'm sorry, let me digress. It, before <coughs> it is determined that rail is a choice, there needs to be a part of the process that looks ex exactly what you're saying. Um, where are the existing bus routes in relationship to proposed stations? What is the reality that those stations will in fact occur? Uh, any, any place you propose a station, you're going to have some sort of community process. They may want it, they may not want it. Um, and then we would look at what we would do to um, have for, for Metro to be able to service those future stations. Um, we don't run a lot of north-south type of service, so these, this would be new service, diversion of existing service. All of that has a cost. Who's going to cover that cost? So before a final decision is made, hopefully that will be looked at uh, and, and determined. Ad in addition to that, um, there's been some indication that if rail comes to be in this county, the RTC will look at um, discretionary monies under their control that today come to Metro that, that might be diverted in the future to uh, rail. If that conversation evolves and that is the case, um, how do we provide more service in an environment in which potentially we have less revenues coming in? So right. a lot a lot of analysis, I hope, that goes way beyond what this study has done to get into the financial aspects before any such decision is made because the impacts on us financially could be monstrous. Right, and that's kind of what I've been saying the whole time is that I'm, I'm really concerned that, um, you know, I feel that, and I said this last time, I feel monies will be diverted away from Metro in order to, um, you know, fund a train that may or may not work. And so I just want to make sure that we work so hard that Metro is going to be healthy. So will that, do you think that that is a, um, s uh, something that you guys will do before December to, to do this exactly what Alex was saying? Well, there's, there's a couple pieces to it, I think. Um, one is we have had a number of questions um, from you in the city of Watsonville, as well as from members of the public about the revenue assumptions. So we're working to prepare an additional appendix that lays out all of the revenue sources um, that were assumed and behind some of the tables we see here. So and I think that will help to facilitate um, this conversation. Um, in terms of the the new service that was identified to connect to rail and create a, transport, a transit network throughout the county that inter could integrate the two. Um, the route changes that were identified um, were did come from Metro staff, so we're working closely with Metro staff, and, and I assume, as, as, as Mr. Clifford pointed out, there'd be a lot of details there to continue to evaluate. I don't expect that those details will all be worked out as part of the unified corridor study. I and mean, we are moving forward looking at a, a set of assumptions, making those assumptions very clear, and having people to make the decisions based on those assumptions, knowing that details will still need to be worked out if um, the scenario under which Mr. Clifford described would move forward. Okay, and then um, the last two questions. One is, I remember, and I can't remember the exact price, but you said it was going to cost how much? Oh, for the, so the assumptions for the rail fare. Per, um, per trip. Per trip, so we are look the way we um, ass the assumptions that we made for the unified corridor study were using a zone system similar to what the smart system used. So the base fare would be 350 for a trip. We could may have up to three zones, so, so an average fare may be 550. Okay, and how much do we charge for us per trip? Base fare two dollars. Two dollars, and um, we may be looking at fare increases at some point, right? It is an ongoing discussion, uh, as the board might recall. We started that discussion and then put it off for a little while while we worked on some other pressing matters. But uh, especially depending on what happens here in a couple of days mm -hmm. with uh, Proposition 6, right. uh, that discussion may come back sooner rather than later. Okay, great. Thank you. And, th and my last question is, and this is something that I really am supportive of, is the bu um, you know bus on shoulder. And I know um, we've, we've had discussions on the bus and how the auxiliary lanes could work. and. And I would really um, hope that that would be included in the discussion at the RTC that we um, move forward with such a, a such a project. And I, I think that I forgot who I spoke to on the board, but you know, having when the auxiliary lanes go, you'll have like, you know, gates will open and buses will be able to drive right through. So they'll have a, a straight path through um, Highway One. So um, I think that's you know really important. So not it's it's for the for the health of Metro. Um, to be able to, you know, continue to get people, well, to start getting people 
on time to, to places where they want to go and they don't have to wake up as early <coughs> to leave South County to get to North County because of, of mm -hmm. the traffic and, and we just become more efficient of an organization. So I, I hope that um, you know, the scenario, whatever scenario gets chosen, that um, bus um, on shoulder, well, that's what I'm calling it, but it could that's be in the auxiliary right. lanes, you know, mm -hmm. um, is, is a priority for it. So, because I think it's, very, it's what we need. And Dr. if I could Crawford, just add, to, can I add something to Mr. Clifford? That's a really good point about the November election and Proposition 6. The assumptions that we have in uh, included do expect that SB1 stays in place. So we would expect about 40% of the funding that we show would go away um, if Prop 6 oh, passed. That'd be just, thank you. Director Kaufman Gomez. Thank you. Um, one of the concerns that comes up, especially in the South County, is to make sure that we're getting out to the Hispanic population. Um, I, th it's very difficult, I think, culturally for them to show up at these meetings. I think they're on the road, they're trying to get with their families. Um, I really want to make sure that we're doing what we possibly can. COPA is one organization that uh, we actually had a meeting in Watsonville last evening that may be a, a helpful resource. And that's through the churches with um, some of the Hispanic population that meets there. Um, and we brought up transportation as, as a really hou a big housing dilemma because it's not only housing, it's the transportation component of housing. And um, we, w I know that there's also a barrier with getting more people from Watsonville in the input and the suggestion of going to where they're at instead of having a workshop that everybody's gonna show up to um, I'm hoping that, that we have more opportunity to get out there to where the, where people are actually at. Go to, go to where they're at instead of ask them to come to where you need to be um, so that we actually get more uh, feedback that comes that way. Because as, as you know, uh, people will come that may not necessarily be from the neighborhood that you're presenting to, um, and it makes it very difficult to, to feel that the comments that you're getting are actually from the neighborhood. So I just want to make sure that we're doing as much <coughs> emphasis there. I also took a visit to the website, and I think we, we need to have a bit more enhancement there for it to be in uh, bilingually. I, I don't know that there's, <coughs> I, I don't think that this particular study is fluently in, in Spanish on that site, but maybe there are some uh, highlights that can be made, maybe uh, an executive summary of some sort mm -hmm. um, that allows it to be um, translated in, in Spanish and a reference to staff that may be able to um, respond back to anybody that is using the website that, that is going there um, and reading this in Spanish. We really appreciate your comments. We are um, translating the FAQs as well as the performance um, dashboard and I'm, I'll let Ginger provide an update on that. The only other comment that I would make is that I believe we still have on our website the translator in Spanish that is automatic. I know it's not a perfect system, um, but there is that, that option for people who would Spanish. Director Rackham. This is kind of a vague question, but it's, I, I, I think it's an important one. When we started this process, I remember Director Leopold saying, you know, if people think when the study comes out, it's just going to be obvious one choice versus the other, and everybody will all agree because the study will prove what's correct, that's not going to happen. There's going to be continuing debate about what it means and how to interpret it and which choices and so forth. I think that's accurate. I, I have another question, which is when we're done with this, we'll make a choice, the RTC will make a choice um, based on input from the public and for, uh, this agency and other groups and so forth. And, they choose whatever scenario gets chosen. Would I be right in thinking that the public would misunderstand if they think that decision will then <coughs> just deter, that, that's it. Our path will be clear when we've made that decision. We're gonna do scenario letter X, whatever it is, and that, that tells us what to do and we'll start investing to make that stuff happen. Am I right in thinking, yeah, you'll choose one of these, we will choose one of these scenarios or the RTC will choose one of these scenarios, but in the end, Let's say, for example, bus on shoulder. That's described a certain kind of process, what it's going to look like. <coughs> the current, what we understand currently is there's at least two places. Um, we're not going to replace the, uh, the bridges for bus on shoulder. So you, the buses will be able to go under the bridge, but the traffic won't. But there's two bridges, the railroad bridges near Apto, in Aptos. You can't do that. You're going to have to get back in the lane of traffic. But that could be changed in the future. Even though this study is not going to answer that question or tell us what that would cost or make it happen, one possible one possibility is you choose a scenario with bus on shoulder. You could spend 
not a half a billion dollars, but you know, many millions of dollars, just change those two bridges, leave the other ones which are exp very expensive alone. Those are you know, uh, bridges that, that are modular bridges that could be put back. So this study is not going to tell us exactly what's going to happen. It's possible we would choose the train um, on the uh, rail corridor, but in the end put bus rapid transit on that same, even though we made the decision for the train based on all the metrics and everything else, ten years out we might decide based on how much it costs to service the train and the cost of rail versus other kinds of things, we might decide to not do the train and actually, but having preserved that corridor, have bus have a bus rapid transit solution of some sort. Am I right in understanding that this doesn't <coughs> lock us into exactly what we're going to do for the next 20 or 30 years? Do I do I get this right? When I get these challenging questions as staff, I always say that we are staff providing information to the commission. The commissions are is the decision makers. And so as we bring this information forward and decisions get made, the commission can decide what is RTC policy to help staff move forward and direct projects that are a priority for our community. And that, that can look a lot of different ways. Director Hagan. Yeah. <coughs> one of the things, one of the concerns I have is the lack of communication to the Hispanic population in Watsonville. The use of the Spanish TV and the Spanish radio, it's almost non-existent. You talk about uh, your website. The people that are using the metro system, I'd say good 60% are minimal if not lack of English speaking. And we don't communicate with those people. I know I get questions all the time. and. I've had to improve my Spanish simply to communicate with these people. And there are so many of them. Many of them are citizens of very limited English speaking. Enough to get their citizenship, but uh, you talk about the website. Uh, my community in Watsonville, Bay Village, <coughs> uh, they may have a cell phone or even a tablet, but they have no idea how to use websites. There are people who are seniors. They're the ones who are using the bus system. And yet, you, the RTC, they have no idea of that communication for coming from you about this or other things that are more basic. And I just say, we need, as board and as the RTC, extensive effort to communicate through Spanish TV and Spanish radio. Director Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I, uh, uh, I've read the report. Uh, I've heard the presentations, but I always learn a little bit more every time I get it. There's, there's a lot of material here. Um, and uh, for those of us who see this more than once, it's actually helpful for us to reinforce this material because some of it isn't um, necessarily intuitive and it takes a little while to uh, assimilate the information. So thank you for doing that and, and thank you uh, for doing it time and time again. Uh, I know you're, you probably <coughs> can give that presentation in your sleep. Um, the, the, uh, this study is important for us to sort of take a look at what's possible uh, under different scenarios and for us to judge what are the metrics in which we want to make decisions. Um, but in uh, almost any scenario or every scenario except the no-build scenario, there's going to be a, a, a need for additional f funding. Uh, some of it we have some ideas on, some of it we don't have ideas on. Um, and <clears throat> And what we're trying to do is build some community awareness and education, uh, some uh, awareness and education on the RTC, Metro, and the other agencies to sort of figure out wh where we want to make investments in the future and what we want to uh, be able to do. Um, I think this is very helpful as, as we look at this menu of options um, uh, that uh, we, we, even with these different scenarios, there still be there, there, there could be some picking of different things off the menu um, that uh, that may not conform exactly to that scenario or this scenario. But 
we might say we want that bus on shoulder and we want that BRT light and we want th th this. Um, we're going to be giving direction to you as staff about the things we want you to continue to investigate because almost all of this, right, as we know from the bus on shoulder is that there was a study done. Uh, we've heard uh, the study. It requires an investment of millions of dollars. The RTC has been supportive of, I think it was $8 million uh, to do the bus on shoulder. We b believe in it. Um, so you could pick a scenario, and we're still committed to the, to the bus on shoulder idea. Uh, I mean, we still we haven't we haven't voted for the funding yet, um, but uh, I know this board is is very interested in that, and this board makes up a good part of the RTC board. So it's hard to imagine bus on shoulder sort of going away. So I just want to remind people that uh, this gives us some uh, some <coughs> guideposts. Uh, it isn't the holy grail, and so you you know it isn't we we aren't isn't going to give us every uh, every answer we want. Uh, and it's not going to uh, open a drawer that's going to provide all the funding that's necessary. There's a lot of work. Um, there's a lot of study. Uh, that, you know, even to do BRT light is going to take a, a, a study to sort of figure out exactly how you would help make that happen. Um, so th this is the beginning of the next phase of the conversation. It's not the end all of the conversation. Um, I would also uh, like to re remind uh, us all, as uh, m most of us are elected representatives, uh, some of us are appointed, um, but we have some responsibility uh, to, uh, to work with the communities that we represent to have them participate in this uh, process. Um, recently, um, there was a housing project in the middle of Live Oak. Uh, and uh, we saw, uh, I saw this as very beneficial to families in Live Oak, especially families at Live Oak Elementary, which was a block and a half away. Sixty percent of the school is, uh, is Latino. And so we worked very hard with the groups at the school, and we found that uh, scheduling it after a Zumba class and providing dinner uh, was a way in which we uh, greatly increased the number of people who participated. Um, we're going to think creatively if we if we if we see if we do not see underrepresented groups, um, the RTC has some responsibility, but we have some responsibility to think creatively about how we could get that done. Not just hey they're there, you go hold another meeting, which is one of the strategies. But how do we uh, bring and make what we do in local government accessible to the people who are not at the table? And um, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, it's not, uh, I, I have been unsuccessful way that I'm, more than I've been successful at doing it, but we have to keep on trying with the, with the local people that we know, with the local institutions we have, um, and the relationships that we have to try to turn people out uh, to participate in these discussions and figure out ways that could be, that, that could be meaningful. Um, I encourage the RTC to be part of those discussions and to be open to, to figure out how the, that, that gets done, but also I want to accept the responsibility for us as the, the elected officials on this or the RTC uh, to, to try to work to make that happen because we, we're here as representatives, not um, we have to move our constituencies to be involved. Thank you. Alta, for real? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so, Speak um, right up. I am from Korea. I live in Watsonville. I have five cars at my house, so I contribute to that <laughs> estimate that you did. Because, um, as you know, we're a commuter school, and so a lot of our students and my own children looking for different ways. I personally don't catch the bus because it takes too long, um, and I have to get up too early to get to it to be to work by 7.30. And so I had wanted to catch the bus. My question to you all um, in doing this study is, a, a couple of things like how do you get a person like me my family on this um, as a way of saying we're contributing to our own um, time <laughs> and and being able to use this as a resource but I'm also inviting and are wondering along with Leopold's question um, have you considered the students at Cabrillo as a discuss a discussion point because we subsidize a couple of the routes and I'm interested in knowing um, if that's ever been a part of the conversation. It, there could be a way that th you've surveyed the riders between the different routes just with a handout on the bus or maybe a link to something that they could do while they're on the bus. I'm just wondering if there's been some communications with the students between those routes 
that um, um, ask about their their participation in the in for voting the, for this. For the um, initial outreach that we did on the study, um, we really directed a lot of our um, outreach towards Watsonville, Watsonville leaders. We had um, surveys, and we also worked closely with Metro to put surveys on some of the buses. Um, I don't remember if it was every single one or if there was, it was every single one, so we should have been able to capture um, both Cabrillo and UCSC students. Okay. Um, we've also had the focus groups, which um, outreach to community organizations, including Cabrillo. Um, okay. Cabrillo in Watsonville was also invited to the meeting next week. Um, so we've, we've um, I appreciated Commissioner Leopold's um, analysis of some of the challenges. Um, RTC staff has tried really hard and we're always open for suggestions on how better to reach these underrepresented communities. So if I can make an opportunity available, you'd be open to that? Um, yeah, <laughs> I'd, love, I'd love to hear it. Right. <laughs> Thank because you. I'm not gonna do this justice having just um, come into this seat and into this role. And so I would really prefer to hear it from those of you who have done the work. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other comments from board members? Pick her up on it and do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, any brief comments from the, um, the public? Uh, but uh, yeah, I want, Vera, I want to get to you too. But any brief comments from the public? Okay, uh, brief comment, please. How, how, how brief please get up. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. Thank yeah, three you. minutes. <laughs> okay. Four years ago. Seven oh, years ago. Sorry. Thank Tell you me your name, too. Uh, Ms. Ron Goodman. Thank you. Mr. Leopold, I'm glad you like to hear repetition, that things get clear on repetition, because you heard this at the RTC meeting. So, um, I wanted to talk about bus rapid transit. Um, I'm concerned that the um, UCS study didn't properly analyze it. I asked the consultants a number of questions. For example, I said, what if I'm trying to go to Cabrillo in Watsonville or in, uh, in Aptos, or I'm trying to go to UCSC, how long is it gonna take me when I have to make connections on the bus? <coughs> they said, well, our numbers in this study didn't include that that would be part of an operational study. And I would say like, imagine if you were to um, have made the decision about the 10 bus and the 12 bus and the 1916 going to UCSC, instead of just having all these different buses that go from different point to point locations, you just had one uh, bus, or in this case a train that just ended downtown or on the west side of Santa Cruz and you had to make a transfer. I think that as a bus user myself and a lot of transit users would be pretty concerned by the fact that this study didn't measure the actual time of that. Without an operational study, we actually don't really know what we're, what we're doing here and we're trying to choose a direction. That's a real problem. Um, I, uh, Hencher and Mully, the authors of the most cited study comparing bus rapid transit and light rail, said that blind commitment for light rail uh, transit has caused many cities to overlook the potential for more cost-effective bus-based systems. This is a real problem that we're doing that here right now. A lot of other cities have learned the hard way that this focus on uh, a train creates an inflexibility um, and some financial crises that occur later. Um, bus routes can be optimized for point-to-point -point service and minimal, trans and minimal transfers. BRT is an extension of bus service, so it allows regular buses to bypass congestion wherever it's feasible. So buses can take the rail, cor can take the rail corridor in the direction of high travel. Um, when it's happening. Uh, bus rapid transit is actually preferred over light rail travel when it's been studied. A comparison by Steer Davies Glebe Consultancy in Nantes, France found that BRT and their transit system was preferred overall when they did a study of the two together, side by side. There are issues like acceleration and deceleration that seem like they're minor things, but on the west side of Santa Cruz where the bus crosses an intersection every 300 feet, either the train is going to plow through the west side at 35 miles an hour, which is actually what one of the um, consultants said would happen, or it's going to have to stop, and a train takes a long time to stop. Uh, on some forms, I've heard people say things like, a train can carry uh, a lot of people. If you did this with buses, you know, because the train comes every 30 minutes, if you did this on buses, you'd have to have a bus every three minutes to carry that many people. And as a bus user, that sounds wonderful. When I was in Boulder, Colorado a couple of weeks ago, buses are incredibly successful there. And part of the reason is that you can walk to a bus stop and within a few minutes, the bus shows up. So people aren't planning their life and going, oh my God, I missed the bus. So that's actually a benefit. Um, 
Buses are very fault tolerant, so if you have a problem on the train and you have to shut down the train system, your public transportation system just came to a halt. Buses can actually take detours and, and do all sorts of things. Since I'm seeing my time is running out, I'll just close with, does Dr. Edward Glazier, professor of economics at Harvard, sa Harvard, said in his speech, 50 years of transportation economics study at Harvard can be boiled down to four words, bus good, train bad. I actually think the train is a wonderful thing. I just don't think it makes sense in our community because it's not flexible enough for what we have. Thanks, wish I had more time because there's so much more to say. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, and Andy Barrow, did you have something to close on? Yeah, I was just going to close oh, as I. Go ahead. I, I think may, so. May want to uh, encourage comment afterwards. So, thank you to Ginger and Grace for that presentation. Oh, that was excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, good. Now, Metro understood and supported the UCIS process, which included developing these scenarios of a mix of thing across all all three quarters at the same time. And it ended up combining information about ridership and capital and operating costs. It was a way to simply present a lot of complex data. And we get that, it's a pretty traditional way of approaching it. Ultimately, however, from the Metro perspective, the mode, the mode choice in each of the three quarters is really a standalone important decision for the countywide public transportation decision. I do have to say so much of what I'm about to say in remaining, you've all raised in your questions. So from the Metro perspective also, staff is going to and currently strongly recommends that some form of public transportation needs to be in that rail reserve. The urban area between Capitola and downtown Santa Cruz Live Oak is the most transit oriented environment in our entire county in terms of density, origin and destination combinations, and a, uh, a viable road network, a grid road network. Transit, sir, and, and, and to be truthful, transit services in either the SoCal Freedom Corridor or the Highway 1 Corridor are not going to be significantly relevant to this Live Oak area in terms of two things, efficient access to this area from the south. If you're on SoCal Freedom or you're on Highway 1, that doesn't take care of this area. And secondly, from this Live Oak area to downtown and UCSC, services in those other corridors aren't really relevant. Uh, in order to determine the most appropriate public transit mode for the rail reserve, Metro staff is continuing to work with Ginger and her team to review both the rail and the BRT data specifically, comparing the various features of ridership, operating, and capital costs. And yes, we will get into the issue of the costs or the additional resources put to a bus feeder network to a rail system. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. I don't want to be like many players in this game over the last two years stating a stance before the facts back it up. So, and another thing uh, Commissioner Dutra touched on and, and someone else touched on, probably one of the most important issues in the choice between rail and BRT in that corridor is the assumptions about the likely availability of funding to build and operate this thing. And I think we all know where this conversation goes and I plan on giving you more detail on numbers and facts in November. But as a reminder, and you've already said this, that we all know Metro currently has only been to barely stabilize our bus service at an admittedly minimally effective level with the available funding. And we acknowledge more than anyone the need to grow our frequency and span of service on our existing routes prior to pursuing new services. So think about that in the context of the cost. Um, following the announcement of RTC staff recommendation, to the commission at their November 15th meeting at Watsonville. The next day we have our board meeting and we will make our staff recommendation to this body as to what we hope we see on the December 6th uh, decision. So that concludes our part, unless you have any other parts to it. Okay, thank so you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Leopold. Uh, well, Leopold. I, I, I thank you for uh, your remarks, uh, Mr. Emerson. I, appreciate uh, the recognition about uh, about how well, what areas of the community are served by uh, by which of these uh, corridors it's very important for us to consider this as part of that mm -hmm. and I and I appreciate you uh, making that clear and also identifying that we we can can't give up a transit corridor uh, we, we should not give up a transit corridor easily right. we have to seriously consider the implications and I look forward to the recommendation okay Thank you, I think that. Uh, One oh. little thing, quick thank you. At, at our meeting, I mentioned uh, in Scotts Valley, the uh, 
being helpful to have the PowerPoint, and I really appreciate that you heard it. And the very next thing, I presentation, I saw that. So I really appreciate the responsiveness that I've seen in, in other topics that have been raised. That you do listen, and thank you for all your work, but really hearing us and addressing these things where you can. So thanks. Okay, we just uh, we're to accept and file this report. I move. I'll move. second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's ordered unanimously. Item number 13, uh, CEO's oral report. Mr. Chair, directors, uh, just a couple of items. Uh, at our last meeting, we talked about the fact that the California Air Resources Board was holding their public hearing on the uh, uh, proposed new regulation that would have us uh, actually have all transit agencies across California uh, being 100% electric by 2040. And as you may recall, they were holding their public hearing at the same date as we had our meeting. I'm happy to report some progress has been made. Remember, through this journey and working with, uh, working actually with the CTA and the California Air Resources Board uh, Executive Director and staff, we've made progress towards their recommend, uh, improving their recommendation. They made their recommendation. Uh, feedback occurred at that meeting. Uh, one valuable um, milestone achieved is they agreed with our, actually it's an interpretation that, that we promulgated through um, California Transit Age Association, um, which is relative to the interpretation of a small property versus a large property. And you recall if we were designated a large property as California Air Res Resources Board was proposing to do, we would have to start uh, mandatorily buying electric buses in any procurement um, sooner than we wanted to, then that would have been as soon as 2023. And if we were designated a small property, it would be mandated starting in 2026. So they've accepted our approach, which is don't reinvent the wheel. Um, the federal government has defined what a small property is and a large property um, under the 5307 funding guidelines. They have accepted that. The executive director put that forward to the board. Their latest version of the ICT actually now reflects that interpretation. So if that is ultimately passed in January, we will be considered a small property and we'll have more discretion. You might recall <coughs> through your previous measure, um, staff had recommended and you had approved that we want to we want to take this a little bit slow. We're a small property. Um, you know, we can't make million dollar mistakes here. We don't want to own buses that poorly perform and we have to keep because they were federally funded for 12 to 14 years. Um, we have buses that we have grants for that are on order. You have a discussion about that later in the agenda. We want to get those buses here. We want to not go after any further grants for electric buses until we get them here. We've got to train our bus operators on how to operate those because th the way you operate it det determines ultimately the range you will get on that bus. Range is super important. And we have to train our mechanics on how to maintain a whole different technology than they're used to maintaining. These don't have combustion engines in them. Um, so we need to take some time and we need to get experience on range. Range today where these <coughs> buses exist uh, is in the range of 120 to 150 miles. That is not good for an agency that needs up to 300 mile range in a day. Uh, so we don't want to overly invest in buses that may be improved as time goes on. My greatest hope that by 2026 when we're mandated to start buying again, that the innovation in battery energy de de density improves and thereby the range of the buses improve and we can buy buses that will provide service on more if not all of our routes. So stay tuned. We still have a lot of issues that we're trying to work through with staff. The board <coughs> has given some indication that they want their staff to go back and work with us, the transit agencies, on a couple of key points. One of, that, one of those are that uh, through the California Transit Association, we've been trying to say we need the board to adopt a benchmarking approach. That is, we need to have a, a pause point in this regulation that, such that over the next couple of years or so, as agencies, particularly large agencies like LAMTA, adopt a full-blown plan to implement electric buses, we pause and we look at that data and we see if that, how that data compares to the technology we use today, how the battery energy density uh, is improving, and maybe most important of all, the cost of propulsion the comparison of the cost per propulsion. If something doesn't happen in a big way with the electric utilities, whether through regulation or not regulation, um, the cost of propulsion, 
propulsion could be huge. And that affects our operating budget, ultimately affects our ability to provide service on the street. So we have to monitor that carefully and, and, and we're still pushing for a pause <coughs> point, maybe what we call an off ramp, at which at some point, two, three, four years down the road, the California Air Resources Board, the board, not the staff, look at data and say, things are going in the right direction, let's keep progressing towards the 2040 mandate and th uh, the current mandate, which would propose to have us only be able to buy electric buses after 2029, or the board looks at it and says, whoa, uh, technology isn't innovating as fast, the costs are super high, we have a lot of work to do, we need to revise the implementation schedule. We think that's the responsible thing to do. So far, the California Air, Air Resources Board staff um, has really heavily opposed that. The other thing that we're fighting hard for is the HVIP uh, funding, which is heavy duty vehicle something or other funding, um, that provides uh, uh, <coughs> money for us for each electric bus that we buy, sort of a credit in the, in the range of about 165000 per bus. That's important because when the electric buses cost about $300,000 more than the conventional fleet that we buy today, that at least helps to offset about half of that. Well, the staff at California Air Resources Board is proposing that we don't get the HVIP money if we buy it in the year in which the buses are mandated to be purchased. So in other words, if we wait until 2026 to buy buses, we don't get the HVIP. If we buy them earlier than that, under their so-called incentive program, you can have the money. And we're trying to argue, hey, you know, state, you're, you're imposing this upon us. It's an unfunded mandate. Don't take away funding that we depend on today to help offset the higher costs of these buses. We're not having success with the staff at this point. They, they are hardline. That money was always intended to be incentive money. Incentive money is intended to incentivize you to do it sooner rather than when it's mandated. We're still fighting that battle. We hope to, we hope to um, you know, impress upon the board ultimately that we desperately need that money irrespective of whether you buy it early or buy it on time just makes common sense. We think it does. Okay, so enough of that on that. Uh, we did have a number of folks, including myself, that attended the CTA fall conference down in Long Beach this week. Um, good sessions. I think we came back with good information. Um, we had sessions, including one that I ran on zero emission buses, and I think we came back with some good notes on important things that we need to consider as we implement that program here. Uh, in addition, I was able to make a good contact with PG&E Bar uh, Aaron and I will be following up in the next week on that, but <coughs> as a result of a PUC regulation recently that mandated that the independently owned utilities must create a program, a multi-million dollar program, to help transit properties put in the electric charging infrastructure, as a result of that mandate, PG&E has a lot of money available they need to invest, and PG&E would like us to be one of their first, they want to investigate with us the possibility of us being one of the first in this region to take advantage of their program. We need that because we're short on money to build the electric charging infrastructure in our yard. So that could be a good contact and I'll give you more about that as we move along. Next, I'd like Barrow to step forward and introduce a new employee. Thank you, Alex. Real quickly, <coughs> um, as a sidebar, Tom Hiltner, your grants ledge analyst, is retiring after 20 years of service to Metro. So I'm here to introduce- Bar the door. There you go. I'll let him go. <laughs> I'm here to introduce his replacement today, but I do want to take note that Tom will be back at the November board meeting being noted for his 20 years of longevity and service to Metro. And then we'll be back in December and January or January with a traditional retirement acknowledgement. So moving on to the new guy. Juan Demu <laughs> Men Mengistu has a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy from Addis Ababa. University in Ethiopia, where he's from. He also has a master's in social work from Andhra University in India, and a PhD in social development from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. So he's the only person I know who's <laughs> traveled the world more than I have. Um, <laughs> we're very happy to have Juan Demu here with us, uh, and the great opportunity of having he and Tom work together for the next month through transition is an invaluable situation for me given Tom's 20 years of institutional memory that we're going to try to drag out of his brain. So back to Wandamu. Before joining Santa Cruz Metro, Wandamu worked as a grant writer for the City of Pacific Grove Public Works Department and had a very successful run there. 
He helped them secure competitive grants from Caltrans, the CTC, and other agencies. And it was a joy for me to hear that he went out and one of those, won one of those active transportation planning grants we hear about, the ATP. He won $6 million for a Highway 68 project having to do with traffic calming and sidewalks and bike lanes. He won a Caltrans planning grant for sea level rise analysis. And lastly, he won a TAMZ grant, the counterpart of uh, RTC in uh, Monterey County for a Highway 68 environmental study. So I'm looking forward to it. And even Tom read some of his grant application, right? And I said, <coughs> wow, that's great stuff. So Wandum also recently received from Stanford University an advanced project management certificate, which he gained advanced tools and techniques to strategically execute projects and programs. And as you know, here at Metro, we all don't just wear one hat. We do lots of things. So more project management expertise we're looking forward to. He's also taught and tutored courses in philosophy, research methodologies, and critical thinking. Wandamu is married and lives in Marina and is hoping to move close metro, closer to Metro in the near future. And I'd just like to have Wandamu say a couple of words. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you Welcome. so much. I'm very happy to be part of Metro. And uh, I'll be looking forward to working with all stakeholders. And thanks so much for this opportunity. Thank you for, thank you for being welcome here. And uh, your background's going to be very much appreciated, I know, in the years to come. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. All right. I have a quick comment on the CEO's comments. Um, the, the situation where the um, we're being uh, part of a program where they're pressing to have everything uh, zero emission by uh, uh, 2040, which <laughs> mainly now focuses on electric. I mean, the hydrogen <coughs> stuff is possible, but probably electric is what we're looking at realistically. Um, it, it makes me think of a, a famous quote from Victor Hugo, who said that the greatest harm, I'm paraphrasing, but the, the greatest harm done to humanity is the misapplication of universal principles to a particular situation. And this is, class, this is classically what we're talking about here. And they really want us to be zero emission. We appreciate that. That's a wonderful goal. We want to be part of it. But it's possible to imagine a situation where the pursuit of that abstract goal leads us to pushing people back into their cars because we can't provide transit service. And that wouldn't be a good outcome, even though the, the goal was a good one and one that we support. And so it's, it's, it's sometimes difficult to get people to let go of universal goals. I mean, they really care about them. We care about them, and it's not like a bad idea that we should be pushing in that direction, but at some point, people have to look at what the real impact of actually making that decision is going to be. So I appreciate you keeping us up to, to date and pressing that question with them rather than passively just accepting there's nothing we can do about it. That We may end up with a bad situation if we don't really make sure we get people to look at what are the real impacts of a decision that's coming down here. Sure. Yeah, I think to summarize uh, to a message to them, let's get real. You know, would be a good <laughs> message. But go ahead, Jimmy. Um, so I, I just want to get clarification. So I, you want to revise the schedule for the electric buses? Is that what I was hearing? So would that um, for 2026? Is that what you're thinking won't be our first bus? Well, we're going to wait until the the technology gets that good before we move forward. And will will the grants that we have now for electric buses buses be at stake? Latter question first. Uh, no, those grants are good. Uh, we're, those buses are going to be coming. Um, in the, so, so it's the four buses that will be here either late next year or okay. early the following year for, for Proteras. You'll have a report on that today, Aaron will give it to you. So those are happening. Nothing okay. changes there. Uh, we want those to get here so that we can do what I described is, is get our operators trained on them, <coughs> get our mechanics trained on how to maintain them, and get some operational experience so we know what the range is and, and where we can place mm -hmm. those buses. We need time to do that. We need to collect our own data. We're a small agency. Um, and the, the, the sort of fight that we've had to get ourselves classified as a small property so that we're not mandated, <coughs> underscore mandated, to buy until 2026 is important to us so that you have more discretion on when you want to start buying again. You can buy sooner. We can go for grants sooner. My advice is that you stay with what you adopted recently, which is let's the position of um, getting the current fleet of electrics here learning about them, watching technology continue to grow, battery energy density grow, and then go out and make another purchase. That could be before 2026, but it may not be until 2026. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. We'll move on to our next item, uh, the consideration of a resolution oh, to a state. Excuse me, I'm sorry. 
Will you get a notice of promotions and new hire? Uh, I don't have a list. Sit behind yeah. your CEO comments, there's a list. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Gina. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Pay no attention to the, the, the woman behind the curtain. <laughs> okay. I apologize. I got back uh, late yesterday here, so I'm catching up. All right. So in the customer service department, we have uh, brought aboard Maria Padilla. And then we have bus operators Brandon Dellis, Scott Ivins, uh, Felicia Matos. We have a facilities maintenance mechanic one, Oscar Gutierrez, a senior accounting technician, Linda Lloyd. You met uh, Wanda Moo earlier, Grants. Paratransit operator, Michael uh, Pino, I believe that's pronounced. A mechanic, another mechanic one, Valentin Rodriguez. And custodial service worker, Arturo Valdez. And I gotta underscore, that's another position that's been hard to recruit for. Um, and then in promotions, I believe these were moves from paracruise to bus operator, Aiden Alvarado, uh, Ivan, Ivan Garcia, Andrew Kearney, and then dispatch scheduler for paratransit, Alma Gutierrez. So we've had new additions and move arounds of promotions. Well, very good. Um, all from good. within, a lot from within. Yeah, definitely mm -hmm. good. Is there anything else, Gina, that we should be doing? <laughs> 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 Not yet. Okay. All right. well, she, she will correct me if I mess up again. <laughs> okay, now we'll move on to item number 14 to consider a resolution to establish the Board of Directors meeting schedule and locations for 2019. Um, so just briefly, this is, uh, Mr. Chair, this is a process you go through. We, we make a proposal. In this case, uh, we, we made it more challenging for you. We made two proposals. <laughs> And uh, as I have in the past, I've, I've uh, tried to convince the board to hold a few more meetings at the Vernon facility than we have uh, recently. Uh, again, that's a good opportunity for us to have more staff participate in the meeting, be exposed to the meeting. Uh, I do believe it saves us some costs, obviously, from traveling all around. Uh, in the proposal that I made, I believe Gina was, is, is B the proposal? Exhibit A shows um, three meetings each in Watsonville and Santa Cruz, and Exhibit B there you go. has two meetings each. So the one that I'm recommending is B, uh, and I tried to be mindful of the previous uh, discussions about wanting to have a balance of Watsonville versus City of Santa Cruz. So I've kept this. Both proposals have are mindful of that balance. Um, B obviously has more meetings at, uh, at Vernon, which is something I think is important for us for cost savings, for having to transport all the equipment and set up. Um, and B still allows us to move around the county and be ex allow um, constituents and others to be exposed to us and have the opportunity to attend meetings. So we'll go with either way. I just recommend B if you're interested in that. Okay, uh, Director Rockton. I'll start with a motion and I won't say anything else unless there's debate, but I, I'll move uh, uh, B, the approach B, which saves a lot of uh, money and more importantly, staff time where mm -hmm. people don't have to travel all over the place. We can come to the meeting and go right back to work uh, at, at Metro. I'll okay. second that. I, I have a comment on that. I, I, you know, my, my problem with B is that we're, we're, we're moving around the county so that the people can have the chance to um, come to um, you know, look meetings that are kind of close to them if they wanted to. Going with B adds one more, one more meeting to North County, and will only allow two now meetings in South County. So instead of in the past having six in North County, now you guys are getting seven, and Watsonville gets taken, and South County gets taken another. So uh, in in the in the in the um, spirit of equity, I hope you guys would consider that, and um, you know consider South County because you just took one more meeting away from. The South. Yes. In terms of actual miles traveled um, and even actual time, the scenario B puts the meetings in the middle of the county, and so the people who are in Santa Rosa Valley and Scotts Valley um, are, are basically, you know, the issue if you move when you move to either end of the county, somebody has to travel a lot further to get to that and stuff. So, I mean, again, if you were putting them in Santa Cruz City uh, Hall, I would understand the point, but. The city of Santa Cruz gets the same number as Watsonville, uh, which are more than the other two cities. And I, I think, uh, again, for us, given our financial situation, have, having our staff uh, not required to like pick themselves up and bring all their, their, 
uh, information equipment and everything else to these meetings is a really good idea. The meetings will be televised in any case for members of the public and frankly based on our, our past experience the number of people that come either I mean it, to City of Santa Cruz meetings versus the, the meetings at uh, Watsonville or uh, uh, Scotts Valley City City Council Chambers it doesn't really dramatically affect the number that show up at those meetings that's just I mean I've been, it's been many decades I've been looking at that reality it doesn't uh, you think well if you move to the city at one end either Watsonville or up to Scotts Valley you'd see a lot of people there from Watsonville or Scotts Valley that's not the case except when you have a particular issue and of course we're still when we're holding special meetings which we do occasionally we may do those wherever we're going to do them Live Oak or some other place to bring members of the public so I don't think this is a fight between Santa Cruz and Watsonville I think this is what's good for the Metro and that's why I support well it I think to call Metro headquarters mid-county is I think really off Mike I hear you. I, any other comments? No. Yes. As the one of the members who does use our transportation sh system to get me to the different meetings, I understand the time. We set a new record last week: two hours and sixteen minutes to get from Metro in Santa Cruz to Transit Center in Watsonville. Yeah, it takes a long time. Uh, I'm aware of that. But I'm also aware of the cost involvement. And in this sense, I have to support the board's suggestion, or Alex's, that we go with item B. And in that sense, I do support it. And I'm using the system to get there, too. Okay, thank you. Trina Kaufman Gomez. You, you mentioned cost. Uh, I don't know how many staff member are in attendance that you're moving them around in terms of that cost. Can you talk a little bit more about what that cost factor is for what you're sacrificing to add one more meeting in Watsonville versus um, meeting up at Metro? Because it's Metro plus Santa Cruz mm -hmm. for us on the commute. So even though it may be just one more for Watsonville, it's still we're, we're probably like 70% North County on what we're coming to for the attendance. So. Yeah, so I didn't quantify this in an empirical way. I, I, it's more of an antidotal argument, um, maybe a common sense argument. I, I think it is pretty safe to assume that when I have to have staff go um, the night before to get ready for an, an on-site meeting, um, that's, that's staff time that I could use better if it was back at the Vernon facility and invested there. Uh, same thing when the staff is traveling to come here, in some cases early to set up, and coming from their workstations to this location to be at the meeting, um, that's all time that I'd rather invest in their work product back at the uh, at the corporate headquarters. So you know, if they're not traveling before the board meeting, they can be at their desk working, and they can be back at their desk working quicker following the board meeting if they're not traveling. So it's more anecdotal, but it's important for me, especially in an environment which, you know, my staff is saying, "Wow, we have a lot, a lot of stuff to do." And you know, there's a lot of other polls on our time, so that's that's kind of what I'm, I'm hoping for. The other the other point I would make is even under B, you still have 50 percent of your meetings that are that are t uh, taking place abroad, um, which if if you look at what other agencies do across the state across the nation, some agencies don't go abroad at all. Matter of fact, many of them don't, and some that do do just a small showing, maybe once a year. They try to move themselves around their service area. Uh, but many, many transit agencies just have a central location that they have all their meetings. Six meetings a year abroad is, is pretty good. That's a pretty good showing of uh, support for s sort of spreading the, the opportunity to attend a meeting around the county. The, the other question I have is, um, can we check the feasibility of doing a, a, t a telelocation so that um, we, we can have, if the South County is not going to want to move in this traffic for an hour and 15 minutes to get to the north end, that we, we can have a designated location to be able to go to and have it um, the telecommute c capability. I know that we have some other boards that are doing that, that there's a, a designated site to go to if you don't want to make the full commute over to the other end. Um, I, I, we have the Tri-County Agency that um, has that opportunity so that even though you have three counties there, there is one location that, um, that people can attend off-site but still participating with the meeting. I would just suggest that that's a board policy decision. Uh, we, we can do whatever the board would like to do. Uh, I hope you would have discussion, though, about the value of, of the members being you know, present in the room versus 
Uh, I think you mean more the public being able to go there. Do I, do I misunderstand? Uh, well, the, the the public as well as as the the board members. I know Monterey Bay Community Power has it where there's a location that the board members are able to log in and still participate, and it's being televised for them so that it, it's it's like skyping basically, and it gives an option for them not to have to leave their offices to go all the way to Monterey from Santa Cruz when they're dealing with all of the traffic impacts um, and the time it takes them to leave their offices to go to a meeting um, clear in another county. So it might help out a little bit of one less vehicle on the road um, and be televised somewhere else. I mean, just, I think we should consider it. I mean, this is a transportation agency and if we could um, have something maybe explored that allows that as an option, um, it might be a little bit more convenient in one less, one or two less vehicles maybe on, on, a, on that road as well. A comment. Um, you know, we're going to be talking most likely about fare increases, and I know that when we talked about um, the fair, the restructuring of our services, we did have a lot of people from South County come up to the meetings, and those meetings were really important to them. And a lot of them, you know, it, it took a lot of struggle. I understand we do have a board member who writes it all the time, but and granted, that's just your job to be here. So if you if you want to be here, you do it. But for a lot of these people, you know, if we're really going to defend the Spanish community then we have to make sure that we're really working with them. And this is gonna be an important issue. And if we're having a lot of our meetings in the North and they have families, they don't, a lot of, maybe they don't have cars, they have to you know, work around jobs, this is something that's gonna be important to them. And you're asking them to, um, you know, you're not offering them the opportunity to go and speak at the meetings that are gonna be convenient for them. So uh, that's where I'm coming from, if we're really gonna take care of the Spanish community. Director Bach, I'll just ask you. I want to be sensitive to Director Dutra's uh, concerns, but, uh, you know, from a position of, you know, I appreciate that Metro takes and puts the show on the road. It does take a lot to mobilize staff. Uh, it's much easier to have the meetings at Vernon and, you know, everybody to present. I can look out in the audience right now and I can pretty much tell you that there's no one in Capitola in this room right now uh, that lives here. So, um, and, and that's not a negative thing because I do feel that the people in Watsonville do make more of an effort to respond to the metro meetings that are there. But the significance of it is, is we're talking about two meetings versus three meetings. And um, I think that, you know, what we've done in the past, we used to have two meetings a month and we streamlined this operation down to one. And I think this is more of a streamlining just to be more efficient. Uh, I know that uh, as Director Dutra mentions, you know, he might be, have a concern about um, uh, fare increases or anything else that might come up. And I do know that this board and staff is sensitive to relocating the case of, of, of a meeting. So I would like to just keep that in our pocket that, you know, I, I'm gonna support measure uh, the option B, but I would be willing at any time, if we get to where there turns out that there is a need, I think that we could at any time change one of the dates of the meetings and, and relocate to Watsonville. But uh, at this time, I think that uh, it's better that we be more sensitive to our staff and, uh, and, and uh, that's why I'll support option B. Director Leopold. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think that uh, when we've considered uh, major changes uh, to service um, or even the fairs, we've gone out and held lots of public meetings. The, 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 the COA, uh, our comprehensive operational analysis, involved many meetings throughout the county um, that weren't board meetings, but they were meetings to, to solicit input from the public. Should we be considering major changes, I would uh, anticipate that we would be holding something like that to better educate uh, the public and give them a voice. Um, it, we heard uh, just moments ago uh, concerns about the RTC process uh, for uh, the Unified Corridor Study, which held meetings in Watsonville, um, but then there was concerns that there weren't people from Watsonville coming and we needed to find other ways to reach people. So uh, I support us looking creatively about how we can reach underrepresented people throughout the county. Um, but I'm not sure that the, the location of the nine o'clock in the morning board meeting for the Metro is gonna, is, is, it should be our, our, our standard for how we're gonna reach those underrepresented populations. I'm not, sh I'm not sure that no matter what we do that we will reach, uh, the underrepresented populations that way. 
Any other comments? Okay. okay, we've got a motion on the floor, so please. And then very quickly. Yeah. Oh, you want to say something? Go ahead. Well, I have been at the meetings at Watsonville where the staff outnumber by far the attending people. And like Mr. Bachdorf said, uh, <laughs> one more meeting, you might reach maybe six, seven people that show up. And the cost-effective situation at that point far outnumbers any reason to have an extra meeting in Watsonville. Thank you. Director Matthews. Concurring with the majority, uh, I serve on several uh, countywide organizations or multi jurisdiction multi-county. Um, and I think our off-site meetings are generous compared to most of those. Um, usually it's one a year um, or they, uh, they go off-site less frequently. So in the interest of efficiency, I, I do support Measure B. Okay, we have a motion on the floor in a second. You, wait, you had a comment? Two sentences. I, I would support B, but I would also like us to consider um, doing something that would look into the, the possibility of doing the, the a, a Skype kind of format for an option. Is that a friendly amendment? If, if it would, um, if yes, please, if that would be feasible. Sure. Let's go ahead. Go ahead. I'm going to speak to the. You go ahead. I, I appreciate the spirit of that and the possibility, and I think it's certainly the idea that the public might have some place where they could testify and we could hear their testimony on a Skype type thing is fine. I think board meeting members need to come to the board meeting. I think it's, I mean, I know there's technology for it, but how many times have you sat in the meeting where the, there's somebody who's on the phone trying to weigh in on it and stuff, and to do that in a public meeting like this, I just think it means you're going to be completely ineffective. So. <laughs> You might as well stay home. I mean, I think in terms of like your ability to affect the outcome of the decisions that matter to you, whether I don't mean just Watsonville for anybody, um, I don't think that technology has reached the point yet where it really allows you to participate as you need to as a board member. So I don't really support that amendment. I, I think I, I don't mind staff getting into what it would cost. You know, look, I'm happy with an amendment that says look into it and see what the cost would be and where we might be able to do it. That's not a big project, but I'm unlikely to support the outcome for uh, to suggest that board members will be participating fully in this meeting over the telephone or a Skype or a, even with a TV screen or anything else. It just, it's ineffective communication for the most part, still, despite the wonders of modern technology. You gotta be at the meeting. So you, you accept a friendly amendment to look into can, Skype? But okay. I don't want a big exhaustive study that yeah. like, you know, spends a lot of money and time. It's, yeah. I'm defeating what we're trying to do here, save staff time and money. My second okay. council. Along with his council. Uh, do you wanna just give direction to staff to look into that issue without it yeah. being in the resolution? Yeah, I think Is that'd that be the best way to go. Uh, so we'll just take the motion to, the motion is to accept the schedule of uh, Exhibit B with two uh, meetings in Wattsville, two in Santa Cruz City Council, and then one in uh, Scotts Valley, as well as one in Capitol, and the rest in at Vernon Street Headquarters. Uh, understood? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Okay. One opposition? And then I'll make a motion that we have to direct staff to uh, look in, you know, without spending a great amount of time, into the feasibility of having some kind of remote location for the public to have an opportunity to speak to us on uh, important meetings or at our, even at our regular meeting or something. We'll find out what that would cost and how that might work. Well, the whole point of this, of doing what you're doing is to save money and now we're spending money to do, thinking about spending money on something else. That doesn't make sense. I'm just saying that I don't mind staff looking into what it might cost. If it's very cheap and it's possible to have a TV screen and we could watch people get up to a microphone during oral communication from somewhere else. I, I'm, let's find out what that costs and, you know, not a big deal. That's, the, that's my motion. I'm Second. trying to be sympathetic to the idea that people have more opportunity to talk to us. Okay. That, that does need a motion. It, it doesn't need a motion. It could okay. just be yeah. direction. Yeah, to just direction. Okay, we'll go to item number 15 to accept and file report Human Resources Department recruit, uh, recruitment update. Don May of the uh, Human Resources Good morning, Chair, Board, and Staff. I'm Dawn Creme, Deputy HR Director for Metro, and I'm here today to give you an update on our recruiting efforts. Um, 
um, pretty much for the last 30 days, how we've um, extensive recruiting efforts in the last 30 days. So it started with us getting a community um, together, a recruitment committee. Um, it consisted of HR, Paracruz, Operations, and UTU. Um, we've had tremendous outreach from our helpers at UTU. We came up with a flyer um, for an open house that, that we um, did, a hiring open house, I'm sorry. And um, our UTU members were actually out handing out flyers to both of these open houses. So um, we did an open house actually yesterday at the um, Metro Center. Um, and the day before that, we did it at the Watsonville Metro Center. We also participated in the job fair at Coconut Grove last week um, called Access to Employment Job Fair. Um, we were actually approached at that job fair by Cabrillo um, Recruitment, and um, they are having a job fair in February or March. She didn't have the exact date, but she um, invited us to be there, so we accepted that, and we will be, we will be there as well. Um, we have social media presence on Facebook, LinkedIn, um, everything. Instagram, we're posting all of our positions everywhere. Um, we've also made calls into our EDD centers um, so that we could go and set up tables there and, and speak to people that are coming to apply for EDD so that we can let them know about our openings. Um, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. We also posted flyers in our um, laundromats, restaurants, everything. Um, operations also came up and developed the We Are Hiring cards, and I believe that you all have a small stack in front of you. Um, the purpose of these cards are if you're at a fast food establishment or any, just anywhere and you're having a conversation with somebody and they're giving you excellent customer service and you're thinking, wow, they would, they would actually fit in great at Metro or they may know somebody, you may get into a conversation with them and oh, my, my brother-in-law just got laid off and he's looking for work or my sister-in-law this or that. So that's what the purpose of these cards are, so that you can just say, oh my gosh, look, here we're you know, hiring at Metro. Not too much information on the cards, but just enough information so that they know where to go, where to look, and, um, and get more information. So this is the flyer that um, actually Operations developed. I'm gonna give them all the credit because it's a beautiful flyer, and, and they came up with that. Um, we also had it posted in the Good Times, so I mean, down to where we place the ad is are things that we're looking at. I have a temporary employee right now on my staff and she's awesome. She actually rides our bus every single day. So um, it was actually her idea that we post it on this side of the magazine so that it would stand out more. Um, so we're proud of that. This um, advertised our open houses and this is the flyer um, that we posted around um, so that people could come to these open houses and get more information. Um, I was, I attended the one yesterday. I did have probably two really good conversations, um, but the purpose of the open houses weren't so much to find the greatest candidates. I mean, we're sitting right there, right where the buses pull up, and so th these are people getting on and off the buses. So it wasn't, I mean, of course, if we met somebody, that'd be great. We were out there with stacks and, of applications and interest cards, but it was more to have the conversations about getting, you know, getting the information out there and let people know that we were hiring. We, we had applications out there for both um, what we have posted now, which are the, the para cruise, uh, paratransit operators and fixed route. Um, but we also had a book out there that listed upcoming possibilities. And then in that was specs to those jobs. So we had people looking through our binder and if there was something that caught their eye, we had them fill out an interest card and we told them we would hold those so that if those positions, if and when those positions opened, we would contact them and say, hey, we got your interest card wanted to let you know it's now posted on our website, please check it out. So, um, Daniel Zargoza and Alex Clifford actually came up with a, an idea to how to reach out to our mostly Spanish speaking community, um, maybe, maybe doing jobs where they don't know that there are better opportunities out there. So we have an employee, his name is Aidan, and he actually started um, with Metro 13 years ago. He used to work in the strawberry fields picking strawberries and ended up having to get a second job, ended up getting a security job at Metro. That's how he found out about Metro. So within being a security guard there, um, a paratransit operator position opened up, he applied for it, got it, has worked for us for 13 years and just now got promoted over to fixed route. 
So they came up with a really good idea. So Daniel and I met with a consultant and we um, had a consultant help us put together an ad. So this is a full page color ad in the La Ganga um, paper that runs in, in Watsonville in Spanish. And so they did an interview with him and then they translated it into Spanish and had it posted. Um, this hit last Friday, I believe, and it's gonna go for 30 days. And I have the English version, if, if you would like, I can read it to you, or our interpreter can interpret what it says. Do you want me to read it? I think you can just pass it around. Okay, yeah, okay. So it just tells his story about where he started, why, how he got into Metro, and um, talks about how it's great and to come and, and be part of Metro. Oh, and then it also um, advertised the open houses that we had. Um, do you have any questions? I think I covered everything. Yes. Have we investigated or, uh, in terms of not just the feasibility but the bang for the buck of paying people a, who, from, from our current <laughs> staff who recommend somebody for the job and then we end up hiring and then they get a you know, one-time cash Hiring bonus, bonus. sometimes? Finders recruitment Finders fee or whatever? We, we have not. It's, it has hit the list of one of those things to talk about because there are some agencies doing that, uh, but we're not actively doing it yet. Um, yes, I, I sent a couple of questions about this. Indeed was one of the websites, MonteryBayHelpWanted.com. What about our adult ed schools? I mean, we have one of our council members of the city of Watsonville, Dr. Bilicic, which is a director of the Watsonville Santa Cruz Adult um, School. Um, CET is another one that's in Watsonville. Uh, getting to some of those agencies where there are some adults actually attending classes um, for not only their um, their status to get their um, the, the immigration part of things to go ahead and get their um, their naturalization, mm -hmm. but um, maybe even community action board. Um, you have Alcance, I think that's through the community action board. Uh, might be a very good resource because they're helping out. Um, the Day Worker Center, which is also uh, with Community Action Board that's over on, I believe, 17th Avenue. Um, so I, I think there's some few, a few other resources that might be very beneficial to check into. I appreciate that. The Director Matthews. Matthews. Uh, Seven. Just yeah. seconding the recruitment bonus, um, we've used that periodically with PD in Santa Cruz. And uh, um, there are benchmarks. It's not just for giving a name. It's for a successful hire and then um, um, being retained after a mm -hmm. period of time. So. Yeah. You use your own staff, and, and I think that can be pretty economical, frankly. Mm -hmm. I had a second suggestion, um, which is, I don't know what we've done with uh, UCSC and Cabrillo both, but partic particularly UCSC. In the early years of the district, we actually had two people with PhDs driving buses, making more money. Speaking as a former English graduate, <laughs> mm -hmm. English literature graduate, you know, there are people that, gra that want to stay in Santa Cruz County that are graduating. There's 19,000 students at UCSC. We might consider, you know, recruiting those folks, and and uh, some of the, we we pay well enough here, and and the benefits are good enough that some people that are thinking, what do I want to do with my life? They might not just come for one year and disappear. They might actually decide this is a career they want. So, Absolutely. that's a huge pool of people, and they, a lot of them go to the career center on campus and ask, you know, what what are my possibilities? We might want to do some more stuff with them. Absolutely, and that's why at the job fair that we did at Coconut Grove, we actually brought a paratransit operator and a, and a fixed ride operator with us. Um, and so they were there to answer any questions. There was a few, for example, a few females that came up and, oh, what are you guys hiring for? And so as soon as we started saying it, they were like, oh, yeah, no, I, I, I'm okay. But right behind them were our two, I called them our junior recruiters because they did so well. And they just ran up and, oh, no, I do it, and we pay for training. And so we thought it was really important to have the actual people there that do the do the job so they can talk about it's not as scary as it looks. You know, you, you, you could do it, and we train you, and, and but we just can't train you to be nice. You know, if, if, you're, if you're a good person and you have good customer service and friendly, we can teach you all the rest. And so that's why we, we had our, our operators with us. And so um, they actually, um, there was one female in particular who was kind of, you know, iffy, and I swear they talked to her for about 20 minutes, and she was just in awe after that and filled out an application, and she's supposed to be sending us her H6, so. Great. Cool. Northcutt, did you have a? Mm, I, let me remember. Oh, I want to invite you, and maybe I can take some of your materials, but we also have a college and career night that's happening on October 29 right, from okay. 6 to 8. Okay. So I think that's Monday. And um, 
the student senate, since we are supporting the metro mm -hmm. system, mm -hmm. we are happy to give out some of those um, great. flyers and our cards. Great, great. I'm happy to steal employees away from other places if that's what you're telling me to do. You know, <laughs> Thank you. I, I, this I, is I, the suggestion. Yeah. yeah. If they're good people. <laughs> yeah. College and Career Night is a very yes. big night at yes. Cabrillo. Yeah. Uh, a, a lot of the high schools have people uh, send people there. It's it's very well populated. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. A real quick one. Do, yes. you, do you have it posted on the buses? I mean, I, I know that we're limited on the advertising mm -hmm. part of it, but um, we're hiring. Yeah. Okay. Just making sure that mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. modality. I've seen that. Yeah. We're also posting it at our customer service locations, um, just so that it's up there and it, it's an eye catcher. Um, good. Good. Yes. Mr. Chair, directors, um, I hope this has served to show you that we're trying to be creative. Um, the environment of recruiting has changed. Um, matter of fact, there was a report out last week, a nationwide report about millions of jobs unfilled across the nation. Um, it, something has changed in a big way, and even in a localized way, you know, the traditional sort of monster.com kind of things just don't work anymore. And so we have to be more aggressive in trying to figure out how to get out to the, the folks that need to be exposed to our information. How would you not come to work for Metro? The pay is good. <laughs> the benefits are just incredible. Um, and so you look at this one campaign and how creative it is. Uh, this is mostly Daniel. I'm, I'm mostly the guy who kind of throws darts at things to make sure we try to get it right. But the, this is tailored to an example of somebody who was doing back-breaking work in the field. Probably wasn't getting benefits. Has found his way to Metro uh, has now good pay, benefits for his family, and has even promoted since coming aboard. That's the kind of example um, that we need to figure out how to put out there more and more to entice people to come here. Um, and even their campaign, uh, I think it was Sarah that came up with this, the little business card idea. You know, wh how many times have you pulled through a McDonald's, mm -hmm. don't admit that you eat McDonald's, <laughs> uh, but how many times have you pulled through a fast food place and the person just gives really good customer service? No, you can be accused of poaching, right? But hey, we'd like to have them come work for us. We'd probably give them better benefits than that fast food place. Just an example, Mike, you suggested the other day to me, um, look, look at uh, um, uh, churches, particularly in the Watsonville area where you have large numbers of people coming. They probably have some sort of pamphlet or, or, or um, agenda or something like that that we could advertise in. We're gonna look into that. That's a great idea. It's another way to get, get to the masses. Alex, on your point, Scott Valley PD has hired a police officer and a dispatcher from Starbucks. <laughs> there you go. So, <laughs> and they both have done very well. So. Excellent. Okay. This is uh, the uh, downside of three and a half percent unemployment in Santa Cruz no County, kidding. right? Absolutely. I mean, it's it's it's, it's a challenge. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Barrow um, uh, will give us an update. Yeah. I don't think so. It's no. okay. uh, we have a, an update on um, educating the public about the benefits of Senate Bill 1, uh, or you could say Proposition 6, I guess, too. Right. Um, real quick reminder here. Everyone knows that this issue is over, worth over $2.5 million annually to Metro. And we won't get into the details of that until and if we have to deal with it. But uh, this, is, uh, this would result in a need for us to make some more hard decisions relating to providing service to our primarily transit-dependent riders. Um, just a couple of things here. In terms of public education, Metro, like many other agencies, has adopted and promoted resolutions that you all passed opposing Prop 6. We also use the last two editions of this to feature on the vehicles on the front and on the inside the explanation of where, how we did it in two cycles. Back in the summer, we talked about what we were able to do with the money, and now we talked about it being at risk with you know Bruce's presentation and those press events we did. So um, we've also contributed uh, information to a singular countywide map of projects that are out there. And there was a lot of planning going on for major efforts by the government agencies uh, 
to, to do more here. But, uh, however, an extensive campaign sponsored specifically us was not implemented based on a number of things, discussions with our peers and their legal counsels, and uh, extensive discussions with California Transit Association staff who provided input from the No on Prop 6 campaign. And the reality here is it is legal for us to go out and educate. But uh, it, there is a very strong sense among the campaign and the CTA staff that efforts like this sort of out of the norm of our regular behavior, and particularly in the last month leading up to elections, would seem inappropriate. And the important point here, although strictly legal, educational efforts by other agencies around the state have resulted in some significant bad press related to accusations of expensive public resources on campaigning for a particular result. Now, ultimately, those weren't factual, but trying to play with the news cycle and tamp down the issue. So um, it's, it's been difficult. Um, ironically, the fact that there's been some backlash press against supposed inappropriate uh, activity by government agency has actually handed a theme or a message to the Pro 6 campaign, which doesn't have as much traction. So in that sense, we're, we've got to trust that the polls are looking fairly positive and there's no need for us to, the risk is higher than the reward of us getting out there and possibly suffering accusations, which can't be played back. We know the realities of media cycle. Um, and lastly, as you've all received your materials about the campaign, in all their testing of messages early, transit is not the message they're mm -hmm. pushing. They're pushing safety, bridges, roadways. We have firefighters, we have police, we have emergency crews. So there's not a lot of resonance in the transit message while it having a high risk of the generic look at those government people doing these things. So I hope the path we've chosen has been the wise one. And that's last Thank you. comment. Yeah. I just say nothing in what you've said means that individual members of the board can't go out there and talk to people about what would happen to this agency and tr public transportation in the county if, it, if six were to pass. That's a different issue of whether the agency is actually publishing stuff and spending money to do it and so forth. But nothing stops us from going out there and making these arguments, and we should be doing it. Yeah. I'm sure we are. Director Matthews? <laughs> we can and we are. And uh, I think what's encouraging is in all the local campaigns, um, individual candidates and uh, advocacy organizations, political organizations have uh, strongly included the no on six message in the door hangers, the statements, the logos they're throwing on their stuff. So we're getting a lot of piggybacking on other political efforts very, very strongly. Mine is really quick. Do, do we have any polling information about this? I know that it's <laughs> frequently brought up of the, you know, where It'll things would stand. The there's there's statewide polling. Mm -hmm. I've seen at least two polls that look, it's, Prop 6 is going down, but it's close, but it's going, it's mm -hmm. failing Closing. at the statewide polls. I've seen two of them, big, big polls. We're not, we're not yeah. doing any local polling I, on this. I saw it too on the local news channel last night showing like 47 percent uh, was opposing 6. Yeah, yeah the, the, the um, most recent information, couple of polls, um, it really boils down to how you ask the question, mm -hmm. and uh, which is pretty typical, I guess. Yeah, um, depending it. on how you ask it, we're marginally winning or marginally losing. So it's it's right there yeah, on it's the edge. Be close. And you know, it, hopefully, the, the you know the folks watching this will understand that um, you know we need we need to do our part here in this county, and and uh, support SB one and understand that if Prop 6 passes, what we'll lose. And what we will lose is magnified as you go across the state. Um, and we will hopefully do our part to offset uh, um, what may happen in other counties that are, that are not as sensitive as we are to the transportation needs. Well, I okay. think this is also in light of um, making sure that we have the voter turnout out there because those that are loyal voters are normally more conservative on voting conservatively so it's it's a really big push to say that it, this might not be a big huge hype election but it's still significant especially in measures like this that are on there and how it affects um, a lot of the agencies okay 
Um, I don't think we need any other public comment. I think we have. We can move on to uh, item number 17. Uh, update on the October 17th uh, special board meeting, and I would just like to summarize that uh, it seemed very positive output. Everybody had a, a good viewpoint. Uh, wanted to add to the discussion and not deter from what we want to be doing. Um, I think everybody was on the bus, so to speak, and uh, I really appreciate the effort that was put into that. It was very worthwhile. Um, and a lot of what we talked about and what we want to do is going to be determined by just what we discussed, Proposition 6. Um, if it, it does not pass, uh, we have uh, some opportunities. If it does pass, we're going to have to be looking at some cutbacks probably. So, uh, Barrow, did you want to summarize some of the discussion? Yeah, and I'll do this real quickly because we will continue on with this theme, but it was worthy to report back. So thank you first to all of you, both the board and uh, management team that participated. But I'm just going to um, touch very quickly on three items, and I'm not going to read them, even though it wants to jump without me touching it. There you go. So w what I thought was very helpful, uh, our facilitator led us through an exercise at the start of the day was to remind ourselves it's not all as doom and gloom <coughs> as we all talk about. And there was a conversation generated by both management team and board to all the various successful things we've done in the last three or four years. And I think that's a very important premise for when you start digging into the hard work. And we do, Alex directs us to do that annually at Metro. And it's a good reality base to give yourself a bit, bit more oomph going forward. So I'm not going to read them, but you all recognize the things that we spoke about. I mean, at the very top was things related to financial realities. But there's a whole lot of specific project-related things in there. We've built up our operational uh, uh, structure here to do business well. And then we've done some very specific initiatives. And again, we won some grants, and it's given us a chance to be successful. We've tightened up our relationship with the colleges, the <coughs> Cabrillo stepping forward with the bus staff program. So we've done lots of good things. So anyway, with that as a background, the most important thing we did during the day was take a first cut at what are the things we really have to focus on, what a focus on what are our strategic priorities. And one of the best thing about it uh, as the day unfolded, I'm not touching this, I don't know why it's <laughs> um, Anyway, the key point was, the, ma the key word here is alignment. The board and the management were in pretty clear alignment on those things that were obviously most important and at a strategic big level rose above everything else. At some point we wanted to debate should you have five, six, or seven, you know, in a generic sense of s priorities. But the reality is those things are our, all of those are vitally important to Metro right now. And we were using a theme recently, Metro has been a fix mode for the last, at least the last four years. We want to move on to the build mode, but we've still got some tightening up to do, which is why this Prop 6 is so important. So, I, you know, without reading them, safety, finance, service, technology rose up to this level because it's so vital to both our internal and external workings. The employees, that's the heart of it. And you hear over and over the 62 buses, that state of good repair. And we won't make it without our partnerships around the town. So as you know, staff will go away and build on that and come back to you, which leads to my closing, which is we told you then that that was just the first step of a process. The strategic business development of the strategic business plan is not just one day talking about it. So, wow. It's just cycling through them. Right. So <laughs> the point being here, it's pretty obvious to me. I've, I've run one of these before. and. Uh, the key point here, this is the last slide. So we'll come out of next week and our reality will be encouraging or a bit of a worry. So just look for us to be engaging you again. It may be through one of the Friday committee days where we can get everyone together and take stock of the reality post Prop 6. And then as I found very important in another property where I worked, <laughs> the third time we'd like to come together with you, once we understand the big picture financially, is you gotta start putting some initiatives in play if you're gonna do anything more than create a nice brochure for the wall. You've gotta actually do actions to pursue the changes to achieve. The next time you do that is in your budget preparation for the next fiscal year. 
When I was at Samtrans, we went through this process and lead up to the next year, we allocated X dollars to initiatives for the strategic plan. They got costed, they got assigned, and you reported back the next year, and the next year we did more. So it's really doing it rather than hanging a nice thing on the wall. So that's my update on the process. I'm really looking forward to the next six months to a year on this. Thank, Thank you. you. Any Thank comments you. from the, the board? I just want to say that, uh, you know, when we were in dire straits not too many years ago, we, we got a really good summary um, of what the position we were in after the recession. And I really appreciate uh, beginning with our CEO, Alex Clifford, on down uh, or up or around uh, that uh, we we had a target, we, we had a reality check, and we, we addressed it, and I think we did, uh, to the credit of the board and the, the whole, uh, all the employees of Santa Cruz Metro, I want to say thank you, because we got some through some really tough times, and I hope we don't have to go through that kind of a situation again uh, after this November 6th election. So uh, I just want to say thank you to getting us into the, the better position that we're in than we surely were four or five years ago, and uh, a lot of credit to our employees and our, our administration and our whole staff. So thank you very much. You're here. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to um, item number 18, accept and file the year-to-date monthly financial report. Good morning. Good morning. That one going to jump on me too. <laughs> so, move things along. <laughs> I know it's October, but Happy New Year for us. It's July 31st. That's what these financials are for today. We're looking forward to uh, having a good year. Um, our numbers so far, um, since it's the first of the month, it's their first month of the year, the month ending and the year-to-date ending. Numbers are exactly the same. Our revenues are looking pretty good. Um, I'll go into some detail when I get to some of these other slides. And for our bottom line of our operating balances, uh, we are on the positive side of our operating balances of our revenue versus our expenses. For the um, budget versus actuals, we're looking pretty good here on the gold side. The variances here, Highway 17, we did have some higher ridership in uh, July, so there's some added in revenues there. Uh, could pause a moment for sales tax. The BOE, or whatever they're calling themselves today, have decided that they are changing the way they give us our revenues, our, our sales tax revenue. And so this, in my opinion, is an, ex is an exasperation of something. They gave us this money in July, and I will tell you the money that we got in August and September aren't, isn't even close to this. So we're not sure what's going on with them. We know that taxes are being uh, collected out there, but the way that the money is coming in is very erratic. They've changed the way that they've done their schedule. They've changed the way that they're giving us money. We're trying to get some more information. Debbie's had multiple conversations with them. So I don't want you to get all excited that, yay, we got a whole bunch of money in July and that should keep going. Just want to quantify your expectations that we did come in much less in August and September. And so if I look at September's numbers right now, we're dead even almost with our budget. So, Director Matthews, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, are local jurisdictions having that same experience yeah. with pass through everybody's having the same thing yeah. yeah we have got a large amount of money in july and then it's been off all, all over the place yeah. for august and september so it's maybe in october good. we'll find out what's going on for other revenue that's our, our advertising our and our interest income right now and we're right on track for federal operating money on the expense side we are under budget <laughs> on almost all of our expenses except on the overtime on the overtime, this is the one that I always tell you to take the first three uh, columns, the two blues and the one red, put that all together. You get favorable vari variance of about $225,000 between those three, three buckets. Um, as you just heard, we hired a lot of people, but we do still have a whole bunch of vacancies right now. Um, additionally, we have uh, extended unpaid leaves that uh, employees are continuing to take, and we have some lower worker comp insurance um, positive things that are happening in, in that area right now. On the service side, we've just started our fiscal year, so we have some professional services that are budgeted that we haven't quite started yet. On the mobile materials and supplies, I think we're uh, or, uh, missing a fuel bill on that one. That's why we're on the positive side of the fuel costs for the month of July. And our settlement costs are a little bit on the bad side. We have a couple of settlements, but again, it is only the first 
month of the year. This is a new slide. Um, I want to show you the transfers that we're doing into our reserves as we, um, as the board committed, we're going to do about $3 million a year into our capital reserves. This is just the start of it. We put $175,000 in there the month of July. Again, because we got that additional revenue in July, we put more in there than what was budgeted for the month of July. Um, I'm going to guess to say that you'll probably see less going in in August and September because of the revenues for the sales tax for Measure D being less than what we budgeted for those two months. In the end, we still expect to put around $2 million in. Did you, you said three, right? Sorry? You expect to put three million in. Three. Did I say? I said two. Yeah. two. Three. <laughs> three. We, we knew you meant three. Three. <laughs> capital budget. This is the uh, revenues that were spent um, for the capital budget. We have about a $17 million capital budget. For the month of July, we spent $158,000 of that. These are the pots of the revenues that we spent. And this is where we spent it. So on the non-revenue side, we bought a tow motor. Sarah and Eddie can go into details if you want to know what that is. Um, on the uh, construction-related projects, that's a little bit of metro base residuals and the transit security projects that we're involved in. On the revenue vehicles, we have fixed route buses, some of the leases that are going in there, Paracruise vans that we've acquired, and we also have some bus repaints that are going on that are coming out of that capital budget. And on the additional information piece, so a year ago, our unemployment was at 5.5, and um, this past July, it was at 4.2. I think it is uh, coming down, as Director Leopold said, it's in the threes right now. On our gas, we were at 2.99 a year ago, and now we're up to 3.79. On the monthly ridership, um, about the same. You can see where the dots on each side of that graph are in about the same area. And then on the Highway 17 in Cabrillo, again, it's approximately the same. So looking forward, this is just a snapshot of where we think uh, September may end up. On our uh, revenues, just a, a, a quick look at them right now before we close the books. Uh, our revenue is slightly under because of the sales tax I just told you about. But our operating expenses are way under. We're about a million six under on the operating expenses. The transfers of budget, as I indicated, are a little less than what we budgeted, again, because of the Measure D sales tax kind of going all over the map. <laughs> but in the end, uh, for September, we believe that we're under budget by about a million six. And so that's, uh, you know, three, four months in, we're, we're doing pretty good. So on to the uncontrollable risk slide. Uh, the biggest risk, as we are all painfully aware of, is going to be on us in about, what, 10, ten, days. 10 days or so. And um, so if um, that passes, we will lose about $2.3 million this year. If it does not pass, then we can continue on with our uh, plan of the money going into our operating budget by a million <coughs> four and the plan of the money going by about $985,000 into our capital budget. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you. Okay. All right. Our breath until, the, yeah. uh, until election day. Exactly. Yeah, right. All right. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Uh, public have any input on this? Okay. We can uh, accept this report. Uh, <coughs> maybe we should take a, a so motion. Have a motion. So moved. Second. Moved and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> so ordered. Thanks. Now we have a uh, approval of a consideration of a contract to GMV uh, Chromatics for purchase and installation of an intelligent transportation system not to exceed $2.2 .2 million. Isaac Good, good morning. Good morning, uh, Chair, members of the board. I'm very pleased to present. We're back again, uh, back from the July 22nd, uh, or this is July 22nd, I believe, board meeting, where it was approved to for us to proceed with the procurement. So I'm pleased to present a proposed contract award for the installation of an intelligent transportation system, or ITS, as we'll refer going forward to our fixed route fleet. So after reviewing seven received proposals, our evaluation team uh, selected GMV Synchromatics as the highest ranking firm. <clears throat> and we really found that they were, uh, what, one thing that really stood out to us with them was that they're, uh, they utilize open standards and uh, they integrate well with other systems and they're not proprietary, among other things. Uh, so 
Consequently, staff is recommending that the board authorize the CEO to execute a contract on behalf of Metro with GMV Synchromatics <coughs> for this ITS in the amount not to exceed $2.2 million. So this additional amount of $618,615 <coughs> beyond the original approved budget would allow for the inclusion of the optional automated passenger counters, or APC, vehicle health monitoring, and pre-trip inspection components for the base AVL or to augment the a base AVL and uh, ABA, including the passenger application or the mobile application. So we are seeking to fund these op uh, additional options as they would provide valuable features such as ridership data for planning and TD reporting, which helps with our federal funding, and uh, real-time vehicle status for our maintenance team. So if the additional amount is not authorized or the CEO chooses not to authorize it, assuming it's approved, we would forego the optional features and at this point and proceed with the installation of the base system. Uh, I'd just like to take a big or give a big thanks and shout out to the evaluation team and purchasing. We made this, they made this happen very fast considering the compressed timeline for this evaluation. That concludes my uh, presentation. Okay. Any comments? Director Chase. Well, I'm going to continue my four years of enthusiasm and support for this project. We're finally moving into this century and bringing uh, our system and district up to the standard that we should be at. And I think it's really, really exciting. I appreciate the work that staff has put into this and finding the right vendor. And I think this is really going to change how uh, folks experience the transit district and really improve access, ridership, and all the things that we need. So thank you so much for your work on this. Thank you. Director Leopold. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the report. and. Uh, I share the enthusiasm of my colleague, uh, but I want to understand this $618,000 because that's a it's, a, it's a lot of money. It's uh, it's maybe one CNG bus, and it's 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 our match for electric bus or something. And so I'm trying to figure out whether these additional features actually help the public, or whether they're an internal uh, piece to it. And and what are out of what bucket are we are are we taking it? The reason why that recommendation is not fully developed is um, this has been on a fast track to go from procurement to award and then in parallel running with the CTC, the California Transportation Commission's approval of these dollars uh, just a short while ago. Um, so, so, and we had to negotiate um, with the vendor in order to get this to you today in a timely fashion and we needed this to happen before uh, the, the November vote so that we could try to do the best, make the best possible effort to secure the funds um, in, in hopes that irrespective of what happens with Proposition 6, the state will still fund us. So there's a lot of challenges, and all of that meant put a big crunch on getting it here today, not after uh, the November vote. Um, so hopefully that's, that's a little more clear. But we haven't fully developed that part of it. Now, APCs, automatic passenger counters, does it help the public? Indirectly, it helps the public. It's, it's not the same as the sort of next bus or the predictive bus component, which is very public facing. The APC aspect of it is where it helps the public is that we're getting more data at a stop level about where people are boarding and alighting. And that data ultimately finds its way into the planning process, um, which will help us develop our routes and our, our run times on the routes much better. To the extent that we can develop the run times, that combined so boarding data combined with on-time performance data that now comes from ABL. Remember today we don't collect any <laughs> performance data. We don't know how our system is operating on time. It's all anecdotal. So now we'll have real data. Those two things come together and to the extent that we can build runs better, we can save money or we can be more efficient or we can plan to move hours into another place and maybe speed the bus system up a little bit. So it's sort of a backside benefit. Uh, but it ultimately helps us. Yeah, so, and, and I have no doubt, uh, you know, I, I recognize value and I'm, you know, I'm just the, the off uh, repeated uh, piece of the 62 buses and I know we had a, you know, a, a plan, uh, you know, to sort of figure out how we would do that over the, over the next 10 or 12 years, you know, to re replace all of our, our buses and I know we just got our capital reserve up to, to where we wanted. So. Uh, I, I just want to, you know, I don't want to just casually spend uh, money that would go for a bus 
Yes. Um, it, you know, I want to understand what the trade-offs are. And if I understand you correctly, is that our approval today would mean that we can get the paperwork in and hopefully get the $1.4 million yes. and that you'll come back to us with an item about um, about whether we're going to spend this over half a million dollars um, or, you know, so we so we can make a, a, a um, an informed decision. Yes. So uh, one correction. It's written today to give me the authority to, to go through that evaluative process and then proceed one way or the other. If you would prefer that it come back to you, we're happy to do that, whichever you prefer. Um, the reason why I had staff write the report this way is for all the reasons you just stated. We talk about if we have money, we should buy buses first priority. Um, but this is a rare opportunity, and I need to be careful. I need to go in and look at the data, make sure that whether I swing towards a bus for the money that we have in capital reserves or use some of that capital reserves to fund this extra uh, amount for APCs, it's clear why we're doing that. If you would prefer we bring that back and not leave it to my discretion, we're happy to do well, that. Well, I mean, or the, or the capital committee. You know, I, I, just, I, I, I just think it's a, it's a, it would, it's, it's a lot of money um, and that w there should be some outside review and, and that would make me feel more comfortable. And if, the, if it's the will of the, uh, I, I don't know the timing on the whole uh, piece is whether it makes sense to give it to the committee, which might be meeting sooner than than the full board i'm comfortable with that but i'm, I'm let me I, just ask our procurement officer aaron um, who negotiates these contracts aaron is there any problem in proceeding with the contract the notice to proceed carving out the apcs and diverting the apcs into another discussion and either exercising or not exercising that option at a later date say 30 60 days down the road well, based on uh, your conversation with the CTC, um, what uh, I had advised Isaac was um, we're, we're still in negotiations with Synchromatics right now, so we need to finish our negotiations. Um, we have received a best and final price from them, but we're still, we still have questions, so we're still negotiating. So uh, what we were uh, trying to accomplish today was the uh, approval of the award. <coughs> for the best position um, on on uh, the prop six vote um, so I, I think we do need a little bit more time I think it's completely appropriate um, and we can execute a contract uh, in the near future but we can do the base contract and and bring back the other to the board in we 30 can do that as well Absolutely. that would yeah. get to where you would like to be I think I, I, and then I, divert I, it to I, capital committee yeah capital, uh, e, e, capital committee is perfectly fine awesome. with me um, to keep it moving along okay yeah Okay. Any further questions? It, yes. Uh, uh, conceptually, I get it, and I'm supportive, but um, I don't know all the acronyms. Alex just explained what APC means. What's AVL, AVAS, and RTPI? I, I just so a AVL is automatic vehicle location. Okay. So that is the big thing that we've been yeah. all been excited about but because you immediately realize, <laughs> well, with AVL, you also have the ability to yeah. provide yeah. the passengers real-time RTP. Yeah. I have real time passenger information, which gives you a website where you can see where your bus in real time. You have an application as, as well where you can see where your bus is in real time uh, and schedule accordingly. Much more convenient. Hopefully, we attract yeah. more discretionary ridership, etc. Uh, other questions about acronyms or ABAS is that's our talking bus system. So, that is just the update to our uh, automated, automatic voice enunciation system. Is that recall? Is sure. And okay. stop. Again, I knew, stop. I knew about the, the stop announcement system. Know, that, yeah, <laughs> call stop. You just say call stop announcement system. Yeah, okay. And that is for ADA compliance. Yeah. Okay. Anything Any else? Any other questions? Uh, who would like to make this I, motion? I'd be happy to <laughs> make the, uh, 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 I guess it's uh, the recommended actions with the pr provision that um, that the uh, capital committee review uh, the the uh, roughly six hundred thousand uh, dollar choices that have to be made um, before their before the expenditure. Second, okay. that makes sense. And, and then return to this board uh, soon thereafter. Yeah. Uh, Just for the public who might not have totally grasped what this means to us, the internal stuff piece of it. When we have to make choices in the past about cutting routes or adding routes or something else, it's like, oh, well, how many people are riding that bus now? Well, 
we know sort of the bus driver to give us and we ask the bus driver how many people are on that route once in a while we spend a bunch of money to hire a one-day survey which the question is was that the right day is it's on a weekday in the afternoon the person counted people on the bus but the bus runs all day and we have one count on that bus and try to guess from that really skimpy information what the heck's going on out there and so this is not a small thing when it comes to like how we spend our money where the routes are directed which routes are really not productive. When, when people tell us, oh, we, I see b empty buses running everywhere, sometimes they're just telling us they see a UCSC bus coming back down the hill in the morning with nobody in it when it's been, couldn't get another person on that bus on the way up. So it's not like an empty bus, it's just the reality of which direction people are going. But sometimes there's segments of routes where there's nobody on it and you could redesign a route so that you actually didn't have so much bus service where it's running a piece of it with no, very few people riding. And we have to do that now based on just a, a guess, Simple based data, on, yeah. you said, anecdotal information. Mm -hmm. This will allow us to know how many people are riding the bus between this stop and that stop, where they get on, where they get off. And it's really, we have to have, we are, we should have had this 25 years ago. I mean, it's, it existed 20 years ago. And, and uh, the fact that it cost a lot of money is why it didn't happen. But it, it, without it, we're really sort of yeah. making planning decisions without any information about what's going on. There's something I may add, um, just to answer Director Leopold's question about public facing, something you realize in the public facing side, is this is real time information. It's not something you get post facto and you say, OK, planning says, OK, we run the metrics and see what the ridership looks like. You have real-time information. The dispatchers will have real-time information as to bus, as to load, as to how many people are on that bus. And from a public-facing perspective, there is the potential to give people a sense of whether a bus is full or not via their application. And another example would be I was riding the bus to UCSC the other morning, and I got passed by three buses. I got on my cell phone, called Ciro. He was already working on it, but eventually an empty bus showed up because they put an extra bus on the route, it'd be nice to like, not have to have a board of directors member on the bus to call up and say, we need another, <laughs> we need another bus on this route. And if somebody down there would actually know that there, how many bus, how many people have been you know, passed by or which buses are full, I guess, is the way the information would come and realize we better get some other uh, equipment out there. <laughs> okay, oh, yes, Norm. And one of the things too is to determine, yeah, we got this route but do we need, say, 11 runs on 79? Maybe the 11 and the three o'clock, there's nobody on the bus consistently. And we can reduce the number of runs, not cut the route, just reduce the number of runs, thanks to real-time information. As I said, we should have had this 25 years. Any comments from the public? Okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Thank you. So we'll move to item 20 to approve the consideration of authorizing the CEO to enter into a memorandum of agreements with the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority for the transfer of 10 2014 uh, diesel electric hybrid express buses and the sale of four uh, 2002 diesel new flyer articulated buses. Good morning. Sir, sir, our Chief Operating Officer. Mr. Chair, Directors, um, personal congratulations to ex officio Director Northcutt's appointment. Yay. <laughs> um, <coughs> before I delve into this staff report, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, Mr. Eddie Benson, the uh, Fleet and Facilities Manager, and his staff that have contributed qu quite a bit of information to this report and have been working uh, diligently behind the scenes with VTA uh, uh, in coordinating this whole process. So as you see before you, uh, we have been speaking to VTA in an attempt to get them to uh, provide us with some additional buses. In the past, the, the partnership with VTA has been very, very uh, uh, beneficial for both sides. Um, they have been very generous with respect to the service that uh, they are partnered with, uh, Highway 17 Express, and we have benefited from six uh, low floor suburban buses in the past that they generously contributed towards. Um, back in 2015, 2016, there was a proposal made that if um, for Metro to be included in a tax measure that was being 
uh, proposed throughout the Santa Clara County. Uh, originally, it, we were on board to be uh, recipients of some of the monies that that particular tax measure was going to generate. But uh, eventually, uh, the tax measure, although it passed, ran into some problems and some of the um, uh, understandings were retracted. Uh, our continued approach to That's VTA has been. <laughs> <laughs> Therein lies the tale. Yeah. <laughs> our continued approach with VTA has basically been to um, convey to them that we want to continue the service uh, and provide the best service for the customers that are using it and that we would uh, graciously accept any kind of assistance from them in the event that they had buses to provide for us. Again, they graciously agreed that they would have 10 buses that they would be able to supply to us. These buses are designed specifically for express service. They are what we call in the, in the uh, field muzzle loaders. They have one door, similar to what we have now. But these are diesel hy uh, electric hybrids. So consequently, um, they have agreed because of the way that uh, their basic uh, business paradigm has panned out, uh, they have decided that the express service for them is not as viable and they are reducing those routes of express service. Because the buses are designed with single door access, they cannot utilize them for fixed route. The conditions under which these buses were purchased were basically uh, a, Cal, uh, a state grant that funded it for 100 percent for them to take them out of service they would have to pay the difference to the state but because we run an express service and these were bought specifically for express service it uh, lends itself well to have a transfer of these buses over to us and we will implement them in express service therefore uh, complying with the requirements of the grant okay uh, <clears throat> These are 2014s. They still have quite a bit of miles left in them. I believe they're an average of about 90,000 each. Like brand new. So uh, we're excited because <laughs> it not only gives us an opportunity to put some newer equipment on the street, it, the configuration of propulsion, the diesel electric propulsion system that it has will allow us to start uh, exposing our operators and our maintenance uh, crews to electric bus technology. In addition, um, being the type of person I am, <laughs> I asked them if they'd throw in a couple, a few articulated buses. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> just, just for good measure, right? <laughs> and uh, they graciously agreed to that. And um, basically, what's before you is the authorization to allow uh, our CEO to enter into a transfer agreement for the 10 buses and a purchase agreement for the four articulateds. And uh, in the spirit of conserving money, uh, they're giving them to us for a dollar each. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Good job. Did you say one dollar? Yes. Now, the cost for us is going to be, and I agreed to this because I felt a little guilty, <laughs> but anyway, um, that we would uh, help them defer the cost of decommissioning those buses, uh, basically taking out back-end equipment. Um, they have, and what I mean by back-end equipment, you have a head sign. The head sign works in conjunction with a uh, DVR type system, right? They want to pull the DVR out, leave the head sign in, and leave it to us as to what we're going to put back in there. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. We're going to run into some expenses. We've asked them. We don't run retreads on our Highway 17 service, so they're all going to have brand new tires. Um, and essentially, the cost for that, um, it's approximately 3700 per bus to decommission on the 10 and $4,800 per bus That's to decommission fun. on the articulated. We get them. Budget bus. Now we paint them. We install the equipment that we need in order to provide the service that we have to here, uh, specific to Metro, and we move forward with uh, whatever repairs may have. Two of the articulated buses are 2000, I mean, four of them are 2002s, two of them had recent engine uh, installed, rebuilt engines installed in them. They're in good running condition. They're all running. They're all in service. So I feel comfortable about this. Uh, 
Mr. Benson's done quite a bit of research and communication with them. They're perfectly fine with, uh, he's perfectly fine with uh, the recommendations that they're giving us for the types of buses that they want to transfer over. So um, I'm open to any questions you might have. Our, our need for 62 buses, I mean, it's a, it's a continual moving target because they, every bus we have is getting older and older. Does this change our need uh, in any significant way then? Um, as I recall, Cyril can confirm, the uh, 62 bus plan that we presented you that we referred to committee, I believe assumed that you accept this. Is that correct, Cyril? Yes. So, yes. so it, was, it helps us bring that helps number down the, yeah. and ultimately get to a balance in 2022, I think it was. Director Rackham. Other than sending them a box of chocolate, do we have some plans to thank them for this level of cooperation? I mean, this is incredible, and we should really quite seriously think about it. I mean, certainly, I'm not prepared with a resolution today, but you should bring us back a resolution of appreciation. We, there's a bunch of stuff we should do and not take this for granted. This is amazing for us. Maybe well, the, the maybe. last time they came down, uh, Mr. Clifford took them to lunch. And I took them for ice cream afterwards. <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> paid paid in total. Chocolate ice cream. You know, Mariani. Like Mar like. Mariani's. Yeah. 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 Right. So, yeah. so yeah. loved it, by the way. Yeah. I, I certainly Good ice cream. Pre prepared to support them. I'm going to go down the row here, Mr. Bonto. I, I just have a quick comment for Eddie. Eddie, you, you're spoiling us because we this is uh, 14 buses for 28 cents each. So you're setting the bar that we're going to expect this in the future. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Director Leopold. Well, uh, I, I appreciate uh, the work you did on this, uh, Ciro. It, it, it takes you going out and, and making this happen in order for us to get this. Uh, it's unfortunate that they didn't uh, fulfill their, uh, the obligation they made as part of their own measure. Uh, so I'm grateful that they uh, saw some value in uh, as buses that they didn't need, that they could uh, find a way to help us out. And this will uh, really help us address part of our fleet needs. So thank you to you and thank you to our staff who will be part of the overhaul of these buses to put them on the street uh, so the, ben the riders can benefit. Thank yes. you. What do we have for the life expectancy of these buses? I mean, how many miles do they have on them? How many years do we expect to be out of them for use? The 10 um, 2014 hybrids have approximately 90,000 miles on them on average. The 2002s, I believe um, they've had engine, re two of them had recent engine rebuilds, all right? So they've, they've got a uh, power pack installed and the other two are not recent, but they're not that old. Not Mr. Benson. The articulated coaches have been overhauled. They roughly got about 60,000 miles off. There you go. Okay. That's great. We, we will be uh, going through them uh, part of the financial consideration that I'd like for you to look at is the one million that I'm asking for uh, to be uh, that we're going to be using to offset all these costs and that'll include the repaints and uh, some of them may need some reupholstering. Uh, they're going to be nice buses when we get done with them uh, worthy of putting them on our service. Dr. Matthews? Um, I was just wondering, it's obviously a deal, but just approximate ballpark what our cost is going to be to get them into operating service. Well, the last, we're working on the costs uh, from a, because it's going to depend again on whether we approve the uh, AVL APC because part of that mm -hmm. equipment's going to be uh, cost factored into installing on these buses. Cameras, uh, the repaints, upholstery. So far, up to now, we've got an approximately $657,000 cost for all 14 buses. That's cheap. Good grief. Yeah, that's it's inexpensive. 10% of oh, what we well. usually No, no, but that's amazing. So I was just curious, the ballpark. Yes, approximately. That's approximately. That's the cost of one bus for us if we buy it in the marketplace. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. 14. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it occurs to me that uh, at an appropriate time, we should really get publicity on this. I mean, this is public dollars well spent. What uh, my suggestion to uh, Mr. Sir, Clifford sir, can was I, to can basically... I can I tackle that, sir? Oh, sure, absolutely. So, uh, you think not? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, Nuria and I have talked about this, and she's willing to come over the hill for a, a press event with the yeah. board and the media. Uh, to sort of hand us the keys. And what Cyril's going to do is he's going to try to get uh, a bus painted as quick as possible with our color scheme on it, and then we'll arrange that, that meeting um, and 
we thought it would be kind of a fun way to acknowledge the partnership uh, and to create the official handover of the buses. Yes. Thank you. One of each. So uh, uh, a hybrid and an articulated, completely painted and Perfect. Uh, outfitted for the, the ceremony. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. That, and that'll probably be within 30 days or so. Can you, do you think that'll be? Do you if you approve this now, they want us to pick them up in five days. Okay. Great. I move approval. <laughs> <laughs> we have to hear from the public. Someone will probably disagree. Yeah. Anybody from or anybody from the public would like to comment on this? This is a terrific deal. Oh, you, oh, thumbs just up. just there thumbs up. Okay. Everybody. Just got thumbs up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. One binder. Well, very quickly, I'd like to note, I'm thrilled about this proposal. Uh, this is our second year we're leasing the three Arctics. When I looked at the board package and saw you were getting four and hearing about the prices, this is wonderful. Uh, I hope we can get some banana slug stickers on the windows yeah. <laughs> and uh, we'll continue to, to support this. This is a great move and I endorse and hope the board will support it. Larry, we expect the university to pay for the stickers. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> it, Very good. It, it, just, it, just a final comment on the publicity. If it's possible to get just a picture of the 10 buses, I mean, put them all in one place on a, you know what I'm saying? Just, just the impact of that many. So um, let me clarify one thing. Uh, five buses will be coming in this year. Five buses will be coming in in 2019. VTA has asked me specifically not to promote their color scheme. Mm -hmm. They want whatever it is we're going to promote. Photoshop to make sure it. that it's ours. <laughs> yeah, Photoshop. <laughs> good luck. I'm not good with these things. Um, but yes, no, we we will we will make it, we'll make it a gala of some sort. Yes, by all okay. means. I move approval of the recommended actions. Second. Okay. Yeah, Motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Very good job and thank you very much. Very, very Great good. Teamwork. Very good mm -hmm. teamwork deal. Thank you. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, item number 21 uh, to update on the zero emission electric buses and related equipment project. That would be Aaron? me. Aaron, yes. I, yeah. <laughs> I think it's still morning. I've got yes. five minutes. Yeah, right. Got it. Uh, I'll, I'll go through this uh, briefly. Please feel free to jump in with any questions. Um, so uh, Santa Cruz Metro adopted a goal to fully uh, <coughs> electrify our fleet by 2040. So we are still working towards that goal. Uh, really, no matter what CARB and the ICT mandate comes down, we're, we're doing this. We're, we're going for it. So. Um, uh, this staff report is, is really just telling you some of the activities that we've been doing to, 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 to meet this goal. Um, at your February meeting, you approved a contract with Proterra, which is an electric bus manufacturer. Uh, they are now uh, manufacturing out of City of Industry here in California, which is great. We did um, visit their factory earlier this year. Um, that contract was for one base bus with nine purchase options. So it's our own contract. We're not piggybacking, which is what we usually do. Um, and we have, uh, uh, as you'll see currently, we have four buses ready to go against that contract. So you approved the first bus in February, uh, and we have three additional buses that we're reporting to you today that we're going to exercise these options for. Um, there's also a little bit of history in here, and I lost Jimmy, for Jimmy. <laughs> about the first LC top bus you know it, it took a long time to get here um, and I know he was a little frustrated so we wanted to provide him and the board with some background about why why did this take so long so um, so first let's talk about that or I can wait and see if he comes did he take his he's phone gone. No. He's, just, he's just gone <laughs> oh okay well I'll call him later so um, uh, I'll just run that through uh, with you really quickly then. You know, this is our first electric bus. There was some time that, that staff needed to learn about electric buses. Um, we needed to learn how an electric bus is different than a CNG or a diesel bus. And when you're trying to buy a new bus, 
you know, we're used to buying CNG buses, we're used to buying diesel buses. This is a little bit of a different thing. So um, we did take some time to do our research, make sure we knew what we wanted, uh, learn how you're specifying an electric bus different from a CNG bus. So uh, that being said, we also immediately launched, uh, if you look at the table, there are some dates. Um, we did get that first grant award in June of 2016. So right after that, I started looking for uh, procurement opportunities. Um, typically, this agency does piggybacking on a large agency's contract. Uh, San Diego, uh, Los Angeles, uh, uh, Washington, we, we've got these, these other contracts that we always use. So um, since electric buses are new, there were not a lot of these contracts out there. Um, it was uh, uh, overwhelming for the state of Washington. Washington DOT uh, awarded a, a new contract for electric buses. Everyone in the country wanted to use it um, because the federal government recently opened up that we can use interstate agreements, not just our own state, which was prevalent for a long time. So everyone jumped on the Washington contract. They wouldn't return my calls. That was fun. So um, we tried, we tried, and it just, there just weren't options out there for electric buses. Um, we have a relationship with CTE, the Center for Transportation and the Environment. They're very involved in the electric bus industry. Uh, they are our project management consultant on the LONO grant that we have for the three over the road coaches, uh, which are still in the works. Um, and so CTE, with their relationship, was able to connect us with Clemson, uh, CAT, Clemson Area Transit in South um, Carolina, and we did a joint procurement with them, which was great. So we took a little bit of time to write the spe technical specifications with them on a base bus. Um, and that was when Al Pierce was here. Uh, and then we, um, uh, Clemson really took the lead, which was great. They did the procurement. Um, we interviewed um, New Flyer, BYD, and Proterra for this award, and, and we did end up um, selecting Proterra. And that's the contract we brought to you in February. Um, so then once you get the contract in place, now you have to go through a configuration period where, you know, Santa Cruz Metro's buses are going to be different than Clemson's buses. So now is when we had to take all of our world of the things we need on a Santa Cruz Metro bus and work with the manufacturer to configure those. Um, a lot of the ITS systems, um, window, brakes, tires, I mean, every little Air thing. Boxes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, this is also new for, for Proterra. Um, you know, they're really a battery manufacturer who's getting in the bus game. They've, they've been in it for a few years now. But um, so we worked with Proterra, also working with our current vendors to try to get all of these things configured and priced. So then the next big lag was our configuration and then getting Proterra to price this. So you have your base bus, and then on top of that, you have all of our special configuration needs. Uh, and then once they say, great, here's the price of your bus, you can execute that contract and place your orders. Um, one thing that we struggled with a little bit was that this is a brand, the, the first grant, the LC Top grant for the downtown Watsonville circulator, it's a brand new route. We don't have data on this route. Um, so planning had to, to spend a little time trying to imagine this route and get some data on it so that we can apply that to what size bus we need and, and uh, what, what, what do we need to run this the most efficient way. So we came up with um, Proterra's E2 Max, which is a 660 kW storage, battery storage uh, bus. Um, the 440s, that's the standard bus Alex mentioned earlier, gets around 120, 150 miles uh, per charge on a run. Um, this E2 Max with the 660, um, we think it'll get about 250, uh, maybe more. They're promising a lot more, but conservatively, we're, we're thinking 250. Uh, and that would let us do this uh, circulator route all day with one bus. Um, if we did it uh, in a, a smaller bus, the 440 bus, it would actually take two buses to, to try to accomplish this route. Um, so we were pretty excited that we did find something that will be one bus that will, should be able to serve this route all day. Um, and then 
we also got a second LC top allocation for another bus. Um, so now we have a second uh, LC top bus, and that bus is going to, um, again, I think we're working on the routes, defer to Barrow on that one, uh, but that is going to be able to service uh, uh, the DAC, the Watsonville area, um, through this program um, in, in another way, instead of having that second bus running the same route. So, so that's exciting. Um, and then, uh, as you can see, the last action was just a couple of weeks ago, October 5th, is when I got that pricing from Proterra. So we're ready, to, we're, we're doing it, right? Uh, Ciro has been heavily involved in that uh, as well because uh, configuring this thing was 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 difficult. It was new. Um, so so that's sort of the, uh, the the delays that you've seen over the last couple of years and really the the time and effort it, it took to get us to this place. So um, then uh, I wanted to also assure you. Um, that we met with the program managers, the LC Top program managers from Caltrans. They came to Metro and visited with us. Alex uh, met with them, and and um, we explained all of this to them, showed them what we had been through, told them where we were at, and really just wanted to make sure that we weren't going to lose these funds because it's you know we're a couple years in, and often they want you to spend that money pretty quickly. Um, so uh, the, 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 the team that visited was, was great and they understood. Uh, they were planners and they really were excited about this route. And um, they uh, subsequently approved and assured us that we will be able to keep this money. Um, and we had a, a timeline that's moved uh, about a year from where it had been reported last to them. So the funding's secure, we're good. Not gonna lose that money. Um, then, as we've been talking about, the CTC also uh, gave us an allocation of uh, $1,956,000 for two electric buses here at the um, uh, meeting on October 18th, um, uh, part of the ESB1 funds uh, that we're receiving now. So uh, that's two more buses. So now we're up to four electric buses. They're all going to be the E2 Max, which is the 660 kW bus. Uh, they're also going to have the duo power drivetrain. It's a technical piece, but it's going to give us more power. Uh, we can climb hills better. We can stay with the flow of traffic. Um, it's it's going to be a nice big bus. Also, it's you know weight is going to be an issue with all these batteries, so it's going to be really good to have that that extra power. Um, so uh, I also want to draw your attention to the attachment A um, because. As a result of the larger bus, the, the 660 kW capacity with uh, the, the dual power drivetrain and all our Santa Cruz Metro configurations, we came in over budget on all three grants. So attachment A um, on the first grant, um, and again, we put these in uh, you know, three years ago, so costs have, have escalated and, and the industry has um, has come around at this point. So um, for the first LC top bus, uh, we're looking for about uh, 28.5. For the second LC top bus, uh, which we rolled in two years of allocation to, to get one bus, uh, mm -hmm. we're looking for about 232,000. For the two buses um, that the CTC just awarded, we're looking for about 534. Um, thousand there. Um, these figures also make the assumption of the <coughs> HVIP uh, vouchers that um, we hope the, the funds are still in the pot when we go to um, pay the bill. Um, and that, Alex, for the HVIP program is the hybrid and zero emission truck and bus voucher incentive project. HVIP. Ooh, HVIP. <laughs> Um, so, so that money should be there, but should that money not be in the pot at the time that we draw, want to draw this down, um, you know, we, we might be short a little bit more as well. That funding is available. That funding resides in the bus uh, replacement fund today in the, the capital FY19 budget. It's there. Um, and we're very happy to, to have that, um, 
that budget, that fund. We're working with it in the 62 bus replacement uh, plan and uh, it'll, it'll really help us out with things like this because this, this often happens. We're doing some cost estimating uh, at, when we're putting in a grant. At the end of the day, sometimes the costs come out a little higher. So, um, so that's my report. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, Director Leopold. Uh, thank you for the report. Uh, I really appreciate all the hard work that's gone into getting these buses. Uh, I think the uh, efforts to find the buses with greater range uh, make a lot of sense uh, because whether you're a gas-powered vehicle or electric vehicle, the manufacturer always has a higher range than what you actually get. Um, so uh, it's so it's um, it it helps and. Uh, you know, it also depends on what route you're going on. If, if these buses were going on a circulator to, to the San Lorenzo Valley, you'd be having a different uh, capacity issue than if they're going on the surface streets in Watsonville or even Santa Cruz. So I think that you, you know, I hope, uh, I'm sure you're thinking about all these things. And it also appears that um, this is continued good ammunition for the conversation you're having with the car board uh, that, um, Costs go up. There are there are real costs associated with it, uh, and even when you're trying to do the best thing possible, you're you're dealing with um, uh, escalating costs on a regular basis, and we haven't hit that curve yet of uh, of uh, seeing those uh, costs decline. So I want to continue. Uh, I want to encourage the continue uh, work that the staff is doing. I pr appreciate the hard work, and uh, I'll remember to tell my colleague as well. So. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, yes, can we talk a little bit more about the timeline? I know that that would be something Jimmy's going to ask of like when do we anticipate um, if this were to go through today? Sure, sure. so I, I did make some notes on that. Um, uh, I, I also wanted to add the, the Gillig buses that we ordered as well just in the 62 bus replacement conversation. Um, we, we placed five of the six buses. We're waiting for Caltrans to authorize our contract on the fifth bus. Uh, Gillick is waiting for it, um, but they are telling us they are holding a production slot for us in July of 2019. Um, those buses go pretty quick through their line. We should have them probably uh, maybe October of next year, which would be great. Um, the four Proteras, um, right now Proteras promising us a February of 2020 delivery, um, and they're, they're holding to that so far. And then um, the three over the road coaches are still in the mix as well. Uh, we do intend to um, perform a procurement for a competitive procurement for over the road coaches in 2020. I would say probably the first quarter of 2020, we'll start that, go out and, and, and try to get a contract for a bus there. Um, so we should see those maybe in 2021. So um, all before 2026, we're, we'll, we'll get at least seven electric buses uh, uh, at uh, in, within our own electric program. Okay. Any other questions? Any comments? Oh, oh, excuse me, Norm. I would just like to say, on behalf of all of our clients, <laughs> thank you for this. And the thing is, the fact that you're dealing with Watsonville, that is such a change from, say, 2004, 2002, when I first came on this board. It is a wonderful, remarkable accomplishment. And I can only say, on behalf of all of us, good God, what a wonderful transition and accomplishment. Thank you, Ciro. Thank you, all of you. Great. Very good. Any other questions from the board? I'll entertain them. Oh, uh, Mr. Clifford. Just briefly, I want to just uh, give you two other pieces of good news. One, I think uh, in a recent meeting we told you we were a little bit worried about our first LC Top grant expiring early next year uh, against the delivery schedule. There was a mismatch and we thought we were going to lose that money. We met with the state and we got, we got information back from them that they're going to let us continue to keep that, that money programmed against those buses. They understood the timeline that Aaron just gave you, um, which was really cool that the state um, didn't go the hard line. Uh, approach and say, if it expires, we take it back. They didn't. We get to keep it. The other is, I, I told you we had those meetings with uh, both the FTA at Washington and uh, <coughs> regional office in San Francisco about our three Lono uh, over the road coach uh, grant dollars and that those were at risk. Uh, 
we got confirmation from them uh, this week in writing that the, the plan that we proposed, they're going to agree to, in which they, uh, they'll let us keep the money for a couple of years while we wait for another vendor to come into the market and then go out for procurement on the uh, over-the-road coaches. Um, they did it in, in a unique way. They did it in email as opposed to a formal letter, but we have printed that email out and we will. Thank you. <laughs> That's very well done. We can tell. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. So, okay. Cast it in concrete. Are you good? Uh, I'd be ready yes. to uh, move to accept and file and just uh, recognize that a, a day in which we talk about 17 new buses uh, for Metro is a great day mm -hmm. at the Metro uh, board. Mm -hmm. Moved and seconded. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Uh, item number 22, to approve the adoption of the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District regulations related to vehicle parking and the use of personal transportation vehicles in or at Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District facilities. Mr. Clifford. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Directors, uh, this is a long-awaited day. We, we don't have a regulation in place today to deal with our park and ride lots uh, and transit facilities, that is, parking at those facilities. Um, I'm really proud to say that we've had a great partnership with our district general counsel, Julie, in, in putting this together. A lot of back and forth, uh, a lot of work with the staff, and we've brought you now what we think is two regulations that are really needed for this organization. So there's, just to clarify, there's two regulations here, and, and so today I'm asking you to approve those. And then there's another topic about SoCal Park and Ride, not in the regulation, a separate recommendation that I have for you in this board report, and I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to close with that because I want to, I want to give you some more information about that particular park and ride lot. Um, as you know from prior reports, we've, we've uh, had a lot of concerns about a couple of things happening at the Scotts Valley Cavallero Transit Center. Uh, one, we've, uh, uh, over time, the tech bus companies have moved in there without permission and absorbed uh, it, uh, almost all of our remaining parking. Um, over the last couple of years, I've been trying to work with them directly to get them out of that facility um, because I didn't have an ordinance that I could rest upon. Um, now, it's not to say they won't creep back in, but if we have an ordinance or a regulation, I'll have something to enforce in the future. Our, I'm happy to say our final tech bus operator, uh, which is Apple, uh, is we're having regular conversations, uh, very collaborative effort. They hope to be out of there by the end of this year. Um, so that's, that's good news. Uh, Google, we, were, we, were, um, we played a role in helping them find an alternate location to where they could go. Um, and then uh, the other one, I forget the name of the other one. Facebook. Facebook, thank you. <laughs> Facebook, we got, we got out of there a couple of months ago. Again, a real collaborative effort. They found another place to go. And uh, so they're, they're gone. One left to go. Um, the other problem that we've been having, as Donna knows very well, is uh, we have some folks, we call them the Blue Bonnet homeowners, uh, that don't have enough parking capacity at their own not too long ago built condominium complex, and uh, they have creeped in and are absorbing more and more parking. And we've threatened them over the years. We posted signs that if you, if you park here, we're going to tow you. Um, they leave for a little while, and then they kind of creep back in a little bit, and now they're back up to full strength again using you know, somewhere between 15 and 20 spaces. Um, they're not authorized to do that, but I, I've had no enforcement arm in which I could go in and do anything about them. Um, uh, so this ordinance helps me to deal with that issue. But specifically at the, the uh, Scotts Valley Transit Center, what this does is it allows me some latitude that once, once uh, Apple leaves, I go in and assess the parking that we have there, the residual parking that we have there, and then if we have some residual parking um, that we don't think we'll need for the marketing efforts for the Highway 17 that we have coming up, then we might, we might, underscore might, enter into some sort of lease arrangement with their association for some of those parking spaces. If we do that, we'll put some sort of caveat on that that says um, once, we re once we reach a certain absorption rate of our existing parking, let's say Highway 17, marketing campaigns are highly successful. Once we get up to something like, say, maybe it's 80, 85 percent, um, we give them notice that we're terminating those leases because we'll need that for our customers, which is what the purpose of the facility was built for. So there may be, there may be a win-win here for sort of the Scotts Valley folks, I think, in overall in this, and it'll give us an enforcement tool. The other thing we're dealing with <coughs> is once we post those, posted those overnight parking, 
we found out, we should have pre-guessed anyway, but we found out there are people that occasionally park there, take Highway 17 over to Amtrak or Caltrain and go away for a couple of days. So they, they would need to park their car there overnight. And we said no overnight parking, right? Because we were focused on the Blue Bonnet folks as opposed to the ridership in general. Um, so we want to come up with a way to make sure that those folks are legitimate because that facility was built. It's not a parking ride. It's not a Caltrans parking ride. It is a facility that was bought and paid for and built for transit purposes, for Highway 17 and for our, our other fixed routes that go through there. Um, so those are legitimate uses. Somebody wanting to get on 17 right over the hill, take Caltrans or uh, take Amtrak off for a couple of days, great. Um, so we'll, what we'll do is we'll investigate some way for them to purchase a permit so that their car can be flagged as a legitimate transit use. And then if we have an enforcement arm that warns people that are not there legitimately overnight, don't have a permit, uh, ultimately if they don't listen, they would, they would get towed. Um, up to today, I could only threaten towing, but I couldn't enforce it because we didn't have a regulation in place to do that. Um, so that's what we're proposing. At Watsonville, we don't, we don't typically have a problem there, but we do have some employee parking spaces. Again, we need to enforce that if somebody were to find their way into those parking spaces. Uh, and we don't, we don't have an issue right now at, at Pacific Station. Uh, and then I'll come back to SoCal Park and Ride in a minute. Now, the other regulation that you have before you has to do with personal vehicles. And this is what's happening uh, in greater numbers now with uh, the jump bike program. And I don't know that the scooters are here yet, but they're arriving everywhere. And they're in masses, these little scooter programs where they rent them, they're electric. Um, you just drop them wherever you want to drop them. And somebody else comes along and, and activates their account, and takes the scooter for a ride. Um, if they're not here, or maybe they're here, but they're not here in mass yet, they will be, because they are virtually everywhere else now. Um, we need to pay attention to a new, de new and developing problem that we're experiencing, uh, at least right now, uh, at the Pacific Station, and that is people just drop these things. They drop the, the jump bikes, and they'll, drop, they'll eventually drop their scooters wherever they want. And so Sierra's having a problem with those things ending up in places they shouldn't end up at, at that transit facility. And so we need a regulation that allows us to take those things and lock them up, and then there'll probably be some sort of fee associated with us having to uh, use our staff time to, to process the return of those vehicles to the city or whomever uh, comes to pick those up. But it is a growing problem, and we need to get our arms around it. Uh, and that includes even skateboards today. People are, people are using these electric skateboards and they're just ending up everywhere. No problem with that. They're great for these first last mile type concepts. We just, people are sort of irresponsible in some cases on how they use those things and, and they're creating an impact on us. So those two regulations I'm here today to ask you to approve. And then separate and apart from that, um, we have this SoCal Park and Ride lot. And uh, I, I wonder, Gina, could you cue that up for me? The, pictures, just want to show you some pictures of some problems that we have regularly incurred. If you know SoCal Park and Ride, um, it's not easy to get a clear visual of it. It's sort of down in a hole and out of sight, out of mind. And by virtue of its location, we encounter a, a number of problems with that. Um, I'm going to show you just a couple of pictures that highlight that. And I will try and see if I have better luck than Vero did with Flickr. And it's, it's the up, down, or left, right? Left, right. Left, right, OK. So this is one, one of the more recent uh, uses in which somebody decided that the SoCal Park and Ride was a campground. Um, I just happened to go through there on a Saturday, thought I would check on it. Uh, my wife and I drove down in there, and lo and behold, what do we find? We find these two vehicles there. Um, sheriffs came out, uh, thank you county folks, uh, came out and dealt with them, and within a couple of days they were gone. Um, but this is not an unusual use at all. Uh, we don't even know how this vehicle was able to operate with only half a windshield. Um, but on the flip side of that vehicle, um, he had, I didn't take a picture of it, he had all kinds of lounge chairs. I mean, it was a regular campground for him. This is not unusual. This is occurring on a regular basis. I wish I could say it's occurring intermittent, but it's occurring on a regular basis. Um, here's another example not too long ago. Um, these, this is common. People show up, they dump cars there. Um, we had a couple of years ago, we had to chase some, some guy off that, um, was doing a full-blown engine retrofit in our facility, taking up a couple spaces, spilling hazardous material, oils and, and, and uh, coolant all over our facility. Um, because out of sight, out of mind, he was, he was there and he could do whatever he wanted. Um, no regular patrols, another vehicle 
uh, obviously somebody who's living long term in their their vehicle, uh, taking up space there. Um, so it's been a, it's it's an it's it's in our assets that we own. This is a, a an asset that presents us an unusual challenge. Um, and then, as you know, um, over time, uh, we've tried to work. Actually, for the last two plus years, probably three years, we've tried to work with various entities within Dominican Hospital to carve out some parking for them to lease, and uh, all of those broke uh, broke down. We were never able to do a deal. And at the end of the day, really, why would they? If we don't have a way of regulating uh, parking here, why wouldn't they just tell people, hey, just go ahead and keep parking there? Why, why do a deal with Santa Cruz, right? So, and that's exactly what was happening. Um, so last uh, in the sequence of events, as you know, you don't have a policy, but we've been proposing that the SoCal Park and Ride might be the optimal place for the future home of our paratransit. Now, you have a lot of discussion about that. We're doing some background investigation. Not too, not too down, long down the road here, we're going to bring you uh, a request to start spending some money on preliminary design and working with the county on how, uh, whether or not we can actually put a paracruise facility here. We think it fits nice. We think it'll be a good neighbor, and we need to get out of our existing facility. Uh, we're paying a lot of money uh, for a, a, a property that um, uh, is poorly managed. We, we don't, uh, they don't do anything for us, but charge us a lot of money. Uh, whatever we want to do to that particular lease facility, we have to spend out of our own pocket. And it's just not an acceptable facility for our employees on a long-term basis. It's not a good facility. Um, we need to stop promising them that we're going to move Paracruz and we need to get something done. On our side, the staff side, We've set a goal of trying to get them out there before the next lease renewal, which is three years down the road. So a lot of work has to be done to design that, make sure it can be done through the county, uh, get it to what is a shelf-ready project, go out, get a grant to get it built. A lot has to be done uh, really in two years to get it to that place. So sort of tangential to that is we need to make sure that, that whatever we do at this facility, we work towards reducing or eliminating the reliance that others might have on this facility because we'd like to transition it eventually to, to uh, the Paracruise. So that's sort of a, a subset. It's, you don't have a policy on that. I'm not saying you should do what I'm recommending because we're going to put Paracruise there. I'm just pointing out that's what we envision for that. The other things I've told you about I think are much more important to pay attention to, uh, which is what's going on with that facility and the fact that um, it's, it, it's heavily used, not predominantly, but heavily used by um, the folks at Dominican. So in preparation for this meeting, I had staff post a sign uh, on the facility saying, you know, we're proposing to close this. We're, well, actually, we're going to close this. And then we also had them go out and paper the windshields of vehicles for a couple of days to make sure everybody knew. And we accomplished what we wanted to. We wanted to, we wanted to force people to call us and tell us who's using it and why they're using it. Uh, and what we learned is something we didn't know is that we have uh, a group of folks, I think they're going to be represented here in the audience today, um, that commute down to Moss Landing associated with, I believe, the aquarium down there, uh, that carpool out of that facility. And, and I guess their numbers can be as much as 15 or so people that, that vanpool out of that facility. That's pretty significant. Um, now, we're not in the business of providing uh, space park and ride for vanpools. This facility, again, not a Caltrans park and ride lot, not listed on their Caltrans site, purchased by this, this organization for the purpose of transit, for the purpose of transit. We used to run more transit, I'm, I'm told, that used this as a park and ride for transit, then it, then it reduced down to just Highway 17 stop, and then we eliminated that a couple of years ago. But we do think that maybe one day down the road we might um, put some more Highway 17 back in here. But for transit, not for park and ride. So any, anything other than somebody parking here to use transit is not an approved use at all. Um, so uh, we, need, we, need to, we need to look at that particular issue. If, if um, Dominican wants to pay for spaces, they need to come back to the table and, and pay. And maybe that money can be used for other ways to open up the facility. Um, so, you know, I'm proposing that we, we close that down. Now, I want to modify my proposal based on the comments that you received, and I, I just want to assure the folks in the audience that all of their emails were printed out and delivered to the board. You have them before you. They're right in front of you. Um, all of the back and forth. We went back to uh, several of the people who wrote emails and said, it, because one of their themes was, gee, you told me you're going to have a board meeting Friday and you're going to close it Monday. They're right. And so one of their themes uh, were you should you should give us more time 
so that we can find another place to go to. Absolutely agree. So my, my recommendation based on the emails and the interaction we've had with those folks is that we postpone the closing of the facility to December 31st of this year. Uh, give them more time to find another place to organize their park and ride around and and that we help them or at least help introduce them to RTC. RTC serves as the organization that works with van pools, car pools. Not us. That's not in our core mission. And when you look at the kinds of things that, that you talked about, which I think really through those seven priorities capture what we do, um, you know, it would be very difficult to fit van pool uh, <laughs> carpools into that. That's just not in our core business. But I also don't want to do something that forces 15 people back into single occupancy vehicles. So I think if we extend the time to close that out to the end of the year, we can introduce them to RTC and hopefully find another place, work collaboratively with them to do that. Um, we've already identified one of the legitimate park and rides, which is the Resurrection Church, I believe, in Aptos. And we've determined that there is more than sufficient capacity at that park and ride lot to absorb th uh, this particular van pool group. That may be one option, there may be others. We just need to engage RTC to see if they will help. So first and foremost, in closing, I'm asking you to approve the regulations irrespective of where you want to go with the SoCal Park and Ride discussion and then look at what I've proposed today to extend the closure of SoCal to the end of the year and to work with the, the uh, aquarium car van poolers. Okay. Okay. <coughs> uh, Director Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, thank you for the report, Mr. Clifford. Uh, it, it wasn't until Tuesday that I had any idea that we were looking at the SoCal uh, Park and Ride uh, closure. Uh, and since then, our office has been contacted by uh, many people, uh, and, I, and I've seen the emails that we received uh, here this morning. Um, <clears throat> so uh, managing our sites is very, very important. Um, uh, I'm less familiar with the Scotts Valley issues, but it seems like there's a good solution uh, there. Um, and on the, uh, on the SoCal Park and Ride lot, um, I, I think we should be proactive in trying to assist uh, folks in finding another place. We should not uh, close this lot um, prematurely uh, when pe people, and if you look at the address, these are all mid-county people who are taking advantage, um, almost all mid-county people are taking advantage of it. And, taking lots of cars off the road that people have to, will then have to fight with uh, traffic. Um, I would hope, uh, uh, I, would, I would suggest that uh, we set a target date of December 31st, but we should also uh, be able to come back and review that if we have not found a spot um, uh, for this legitimate use. Uh, I, I, I wanna, uh, until we do, it, it seems, um, well, Criminal is, the, is too strong of a word, but to, to take an available resource uh, for people who are engaging in alternative transportation, it, it, it just doesn't seem, um, uh, it, it may not uh, directly be in our mission, but it's definitely within our values. And so, uh, so I, I, I'm willing to work with that. And, and you know, when, when we talked on Wednesday uh, about reaching out to the RTC, I will play an active role in that. Uh, I have also been working with Mr. Clifford to try to get Dominican to, to um, lease some of these spaces. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, last year Dominican uh, decided to change their parking policies and they closed their lot at the hospital uh, to other people. <clears throat> um, and they've, they have their very legitimate reasons for doing it, but there are a number of doctor's offices um, who woke up to the fact that they did not have enough parking for their staff and their patients. Uh, this generated a lot of concern, a lot of calls from doctor's offices to my office, um, and we thought we had a group of doctors who said that they were interested in leasing this space, and we thought that was a win-win uh, for everybody involved. Um, they have not acted on it. Uh, strangely, they keep on complaining to me uh, about not having enough parking, even though there's an option uh, for them. So I get that uh, uh, the piece about um, uh, uh, about not giving away something for free when uh, people who have the means and have the resources and have the need uh, to, uh, to, to lease the space should actually lease it. 
but I really care about this uh, van pool. Um, I think that that, uh, that that we have to do everything in our power to make sure that there is an adequate place for them. Um, while we have this resource, uh, a future use for Paracruz uh, is very interesting, and um, I'm, uh, I'd be interested in working with the staff uh, in conversations with Public Works and planning about uh, uh, the uh, whether that will work and, and what that would mean. Um, but we, we are an uh, organization that cares about transportation. We can't leave these folks from Mbari out of the, out of the cold. Rogers. It's rare for me to disagree with my colleague, John Leopold. But, um, and I'm not against the idea of yeah. our staff helping. I'm glad that you've already thought about how to help people extending the deadline for moving. But there's no way this agency should own this problem. It's somebody else's problem, and we have enough problems. And so, whereas it's one thing to say we'll try and help people, that we're already working with them to try and find alternatives. I think on December 31st, if there's not an alternative, it's not our problem. And I don't think we, owe, we should spend our, we, our staff time or certainly any money to develop a park and ride lot for somebody. It's I'm not in our mission. And so I just want to be really clear without, you know, again, I, I don't think we want to be nasty or capricious about this, but I think we have to state early. And I, I, I say this is based on my experience of people sort of developing a sense of ownership of things when you don't confront them directly when there's this kind of problem. And I think we need to make very clear this is not a future parking ride lot. We don't own the obligation of coming up with an alternative to it when maybe there's not one. But again, they should go talk to the RTC. They should, and I appreciate about the level our staff's been working on this, but it's not our problem to have our staff find an alternative here. It's well, not, they, not, they will have not failed if there's not an alternative to this law, in my point of view. Well, and, and just in response, uh, in respectful dialogue with my colleague, uh, <laughs> I, uh, true, we don't own, own this problem, but we have an Chris. empty lot, which people just found out that they have to make some changes. There is, uh, there is interest uh, for others to help, um, and uh, our future use is three years away. So uh, we, can, we, can sh uh, we can address the concerns, we can uh, work to, to support them, not give them ownership rights, but, uh, but let's find a place to, to, to support alternative transportation. Um, we didn't know this existed. Let's, let's not make uh, uh, quick decisions. Uh, and uh, we, we may be able to resolve this by December 31st, but if we can't, let's, let's, it's arbitrary. It's completely arbitrary to, to, to set a deadline uh, when our future use is three years away. So uh, I, three months, it seems like it should be enough time to, uh, to address these concerns, um, but if for some reason we're close, we shouldn't just do something. We, should, we can come back at our December meeting and, and make a final decision. Director Matthews. I, I think I fall somewhere between the, the comments already made. Um, how, many, how many spaces are on this lot? That's just a, a curious question on my part. Ballpark. 107. Okay. 70. 107. Yeah, 100. Okay. Um, and is the proposal, if closed, that it is closed, there's chains up and nobody parks there? Is that? Yes, there, there are gates there. There have always been okay. gates there. We've reconditioned them so that they can be locked. Uh, I would guess we'd probably put a Knox box on it, zero, so fire, police and fire could still get into it if they needed to. It seems to me there's no particular advantage to that, but I do agree with Mike that um, um, it's our lot for our purposes and other arrangements could be made. Um, I'm thinking in downtown Santa Cruz, everyone's familiar with Calvary Church and this parking lot next door to it. Well, that belongs to Calvary Church. The city leases it, and they now have plans coming up in the future for housing on, in a relatively short time frame. So our lease now is a year at a time from Calvary to lease that parking lot. But everyone who has a uh, who parks there has a permit there knows now that <laughs> there's a horizon to that, and it does seem to me. I mean, I don't know the relationships, but um, the possibility of saying free parking on this lot is not going to be available as of a certain date, and and see if RTC will 
rent from us for, I, I don't know what the possibilities are, but for a permit program for Van Pool and also maybe Dominican or the doctors or whoever start permit parking with a clear understanding it's interim. And we're looking at, you don't have a lifetime tenancy on these parking spaces, but that uses it and we derive some income from it and we have clear ownership of it. So that would seem to me a way of achieving both things. I don't know how usable that, how, how feasible that is. Director Lynn. Yeah, I have, um, having worked with the Scotts Valley situation, um, we'd been working with the townhomes that had been parking and they wanted, when they contacted me, they wanted 50 places. And I'd explained that when they purchased, it was actually in the CCNRs that yeah. they, and they said, well, yeah, but we have kids and they grew and now we, you know, we feel that we've been allowed to use it and no one's enforced it, so we feel we have rights and this has been going on for over a year. And then from there, um, some of the high tech companies became an issue as well. And now in another area privately owned, we have doctors offices near on a private lot that is proposed for development and they're contacting us saying, will we expect you to resolve the situation? So all I can tell you is that having really been in the middle of it, I can see that we have to be very careful. And, mm -hmm. and even though uh, we worked with uh, one of the groups to find parking at another location that ended, then they expected us to resolve the next. So it's really become challenging in Scotts Valley. So I, I really think we need to be careful that we have some um, expectations and as Cynthia mentioned having at least some maybe a proposal to rent back if that that works but it gets out of hand really fast as we found so and if if I could just comment on that a permit program would serve that I think Alex for Scotts Valley you were thinking of um, taking <coughs> off all the the um, corporate bus use parking um, and then seeing what's your capacity and um, I mean, my thought would be just individual permits, because let's say you initially do 30 permits, and it turns out you really only can afford to do 15 permits in turn. I mean, that's, that's easy. You just withdraw those permits for whatever the, the time length is. And, and anyway, I think there are a lot of ways to um, uh, optimize the use of the lots without giving up control of them. I think that's the bottom line. I, I won't even sure what the implications are, but I just people should be aware of the fact that the idea that RTC funds this in some way means they probably take the money out of the, the tax dollars that would otherwise <laughs> come, otherwise come to us. So you want to think about that too while we're at you know, yeah. the complexity yeah. well, of this thing. Well, <laughs> well, the other the, the other thing I, I want to uh, point out in, in Mr. Clifford's uh, opening. It's been a couple of years of ne friendly negotiations, as it's been described, with the tech companies to find them a better place to move their bus. Mm -hmm. If we're if we're not going to give a reasonable amount of time yeah. for Embari uh, to to find a place to to move their facility, we're sending out the wrong message. All right. The, the, if we're going to give tech companies two years to figure it out, but we're going to give these Embari employees a week. Um, or even three months. I mean, I, I just want to just w w find some balance in the way in which we're uh, uh, interacting with the public. Mr. Clifford. No, I, I definitely appreciate that point. The, the only distinction I would make is two years ago, if I'd had a regulation in place, I, I would have been here a lot sooner to, to have dealt with them. Um, the, the point that uh, Director Matthews makes, um, the, the I get what you're saying, but it gets complex as you get into it a little I bit know, deeper. It's it's a large facility. It's down in a hole. It's out of sight, out of mind. Um, once if we don't lock it down, we have to create some sort of enforcement. And now that means I've got to go out and hire security to regularly roll through there, and that there's going to be a cost to doing that. And I think the original thought was if we did a deal with Dominican then um, you know, their, their resources would be used to offset some costs associated with some kind of security element that we would have there. Um, but, but just issuing permits or 
putting a parking meter there right now I think isn't going to generate enough revenues to offset the, the regular patrol that I'd have to put there. If I can lock it down, then I don't have to invest in, in the, uh, the security element of it. That's, that's the struggle. Okay. I'd like to, if there's anybody from the public that would like to address us on this. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Peter. I live in the Live Oak area. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak publicly about the park and ride lot closure that was uh, just announced on Monday for this following Monday, basically giving us six days notice before closing it down. I appreciate the time you've all spent to receive our comments and also read the comments, print them out, and have them available to the, to the board today. I'd like to uh, strongly um, oppose and disagree with your closure of this park and ride lot. Uh, it's been used by myself and other coworkers for uh, over a year after trying to find other locations for carpooling and van pooling to work. Um, I agree with uh, Director Leopold that we should deserve the same courtesy and um, opportunity that you've given to Facebook and other companies uh, regarding finding suitable parking. Uh, regarding the pictures that you showed, uh, I've noticed that same thing in that parking lot. I use it every day. Um, a lot of those problems increased when the chain was taken down, separating the lower lot from the upper lot. A lot of that lower lot area, you can tell, is used by people that are not commuting, that are not using transit. And if that chain was either reinstalled or if temporary fencing was dividing that lot, I think a lot of those problems would go away. Unfortunately, um, all those pictures could be also taken on any street in the Live Oak Mid-County area you're not solving any problems by closing that lot, you're just displacing them to some up somewhere else. Does that make sense? Um, we worked with uh, a variety of places, trying to find places to park, talking to the Sheriff's Department, and they recommended using the park and ride lot because that's available and it'll be there forever. Um, that apparently is not true. I'd like to also pass around this Cruise 511 document and also read from it. Park and ride lots can help make your commute a breeze by offering a convenient and safe location to transfer from a single passenger vehicle or bicycle to a carpool, van pool, or transit. So the park and ride lots are for van pools, which is in disagreement with what you said. You wanna pass this around? Okay. Um, finally, um, that lot was just repainted, it was just resurfaced. Bike parking is available, and it's also, I think, the only centrally located uh, park and ride lot in the Santa Cruz area. All the other locations are out in Aptos or up the road past Tiempo. Uh, if we're really trying to find sustainable transportation op uh, opportunities or alternatives, I think we need to continue having park and ride lots such as this one. Closing it down is not make any sense to me. It actually doesn't solve any problems, and it actually creates more problems. So thank you. Thank you for waiting your comments. Hi, um, my name is Sue, and I'm part of a van pool <coughs> that commutes to Monterey. Um, my phone call wasn't registered in this packet. I'm not part of the Ambari group, so there are more than 15 of us. Um, there's between seven and 10 of us that have rotated through this van pool that park run lot's been there for what a decade or something and we get what 10 days notice that it's gonna close um, I always thought that it was intended as a park and ride lot and so I never really factored that it was a privilege to be using it and that it might go away but I don't feel like I'm assuming that I have this privilege to use this lot and I understand that it's your property and that you get to manage it how you want it I'm just requesting that you understand that we don't have an option in Santa Cruz and to shift to Aptos, like there are people who come to this lot on their bikes. And so going to Aptos at 6.30 in the morning from the west side of Santa Cruz isn't really an option. And so when I called and talked to your people about what are our options and they said, oh, the Quaker Meeting House, well, that closed in January. And so we can't meet there we're using the Paul Sweet Road because that's the only option in the area. Our, our group comes from the west side and downtown and the mid-county where your constituents are from. 
So to shift to Aptos doesn't really work for people who are riding their bikes. And so the idea of closing the last park and ride lot in the Santa Cruz area, it just seems like it's sending the wrong message to the community, like get back in your single occupant vehicle and you know, don't, it doesn't encourage fan pooling and ride sharing. There were some other people here who were ride sharers who also aren't part of that Ambari group, but they left like at 11 o'clock because it's been a long wait. Yeah. Um, so, Sorry um, for doing that to you. So my, my confusion is like you guys decided to do this and it was recommended that we all shift to the Quaker lot. Well, the Quaker lot isn't an option for us. So like it's like you haven't done your homework because you decided to do this and we don't have an option. So I appreciate you looking at options for us. I understand that that's maybe not your job and I didn't know that the RTC was the agency that was involved. I saw this Cruise 511 has a list and their list shows that the Quaker lot was closed. Um, so yeah, sending the right message to the community, it just seems like a step backwards rather than a step forwards. And hearing that presentation about the HOV lanes and trying to get people out of their SOVs, it just doesn't, the message doesn't jive. So um, yeah, I just don't know what the Metro role is. So this has been very enlightening to understand the Metro role and if we can at all do something to find a, another place, I would appreciate your help because we don't know where else to go. Um, we're operating seven days a week. Yeah, well, I would appreciate if you, you could, uh, I'll give you my card at the uh, end of this, uh, so I have your contact information so I can get a better idea of what's out there. Uh -huh. Because I, I'm committed to working to, uh, to find something that's gonna work out. Uh -huh. We can't lose these uh, alternative transportation opportunities right. where people are choosing to carpool. We spend a lot of money each year trying to get people to carpool and then when they actually do it, we should find a way to support them. The question is whether Metro should support them. I get that. Um, but there is the Regional Transportation Commission, uh, which I will, uh, I'll be on the phone with to try to get them uh, uh, to work on it. And what I ask the Metro Board is that if we're making positive movement towards that, but we can't make a December 31st deadline, that that this, that this board uh, recognize that there's efforts to make this happen and, um, and uh, not just set an arbitrary date uh, after giving so much time for other users in other parking lots uh, to find alternative opportunities to, 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 uh, to, to, to carpool or take buses. Yeah, I was gonna go over to the church next to the Quakers and ask them if we could start using their, I mean, you know, there are places we can ask, but yeah. somebody's gotta do that legwork. So we can all try yeah. and Rick find something. Tour. Yeah. Yeah, just Thank one you. quick question. I have a comment. Did, I heard the term park and ride a lot. Uh, did you state in your talk that it is not a park and ride lot? It is not a Caltrans park and ride lot. Okay, all right. Yeah, we, we oftentimes use that term, and I know the gentleman referred to the 511 site, but usually you're talking about Caltrans park and ride lots, which are the Resurrection Church, Paso Tiempo. I got that. I just wanted to be clear, because what I understand is I understand that, 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 that there is a need to use a place to leave your cars and that you want to engage in public transportation. We all get that. But uh, the position that I'm gonna take as a board member is I'm trying to be supportive of Metro and its operations. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I can appreciate uh, uh, Commissioner Leopold's comments about you know, giving the, the, the time to other agencies. We have been trying to deal with recapturing our parking lots from these bus transfer groups the minute they started doing this service. This is the Apples and the Googles. And it's a process, as, as the, uh, Mr. Clipper mentioned, just to identify that this is going on. Uh, and then it takes us time to get this. This is the first time the board has actually got a presentation where we're asked to take back control of our lots with it by doing some action. Uh, not just the Scotts Valley homeowners, but, but anybody else who's been abusing our lots. I'm very sensitive to parking. Here in Capitola, parking in the village is an ultimate commodity. We have two lots around us that we have to go to extreme lengths to protect people from parking in those lots. So, you know, as an agency, you know, it's not just we just have parking to spare. Uh, if we were able to lease this lot and generate revenue, that's another thing we're committed to. So it's not like I'm anti this group or these people or you people who have this need to commute, but 
the true person who this falls on is the RTC. This is their function that they preserve. And, and I think we need to redirect our energy towards the RTC should be able, should be the ones you contact to go out and find you. I think that we, as there's a lot of duplication of members here that serve on both boards, and I'm willing to work as a member of the RTC, but, but my, my focus today right now is I'm a member of Metro, and uh, I, I'm willing to support, and I'm gonna make a motion that we support uh, m making this deadline December 31st. Because what I want to do is I want to incentivize you to get a hold of the RTC, to start making contacts, to find places. You know, I think Commissioner Leopold is committed to trying to find places and make this happen. It's uh, November 1st right now, so that's two months to reach out and find a place to park some cars. So I think there needs to be some effort to try to do this, and, and uh, I'm going to stimulate that action. I will say that, that being the fact that I'm willing to make this motion, uh, if you come back in December and it turns out that you're struggling with this, I think there's going to be some lenience in, leniency in this group to try to, to work with you on that. But I think the message that, that I want to send as a board member is, is that this is our personal lot. We need to recapture it from all the pictures that you saw there, people that are abusing this lot, because we have plans. And, and there is liability that goes along with having a parking lot and people there. And it, the fact that it is our personal property, I think we're entitled to do that. So that's my motion. I'll second the motion and have a brief comment. Sure. My, my, I, he said everything I want to say, and it, don't, don't, I'll just emphasize the issue about what happens in December if it's like not resolved, but you're, there's stuff moving and stuff. I mean, we're not going to like kick people out if they, it looks like it can get fixed in a month or two after that or something unreasonable, but I think we need to send a clear message now. I've just had too much experience as a 26-year council member of people never taking you seriously because you say we're going to do something with this and then when you start then you start with this problem when it's too late to fix it because now you really do have to get people out and build the building or whatever you're doing so i i, I think we want to declare the december uh, deadline as uh, as we did, but in the december meeting or if it came to it and stuff you know if, if you want to try and find an amendment to fix the motion so it's clear that we have at least an opportunity to look at it there that's a different issue but i think we should establish the deadline of 31st to support the I, motion I um, I think that we we need to move on this, but I, I think we it's going to take more than 60 days to come to a resolution. I think we should wait for say April 1st or give it you know that first quarter uh, and at least that much time. Uh, and I would offer that as a friendly amendment to uh, instead of um, what was it uh, January 1st or so. Uh, yeah, December 31st to go to April uh, or excuse me March 30th. I. I, I Oh. I'm willing to accept that amendment too, and I'll go ahead and make it um, um, is that the 31st, friendly amendment, March 31st? Is no, it? I think it's yeah, yeah, March, yeah. March, March, March 31st. 31st. Yes, I'm willing to accept that amendment and make it the second. Yeah, that's fine with the second. Okay. Well, I appreciate the uh, recommendation of the chair. Uh, I think that the, this is a resolvable issue. And I think that uh, by us uh, taking g giving enough time to you could actually resolve it. Um, uh, will mean that we're sending the message that we actually care about these folks and that we want to find a way to support them in their activity of taking cars off the road. And I will be working uh, with them and with the RTC uh, staff. That's so why. Okay, yes. Also, I, I would, the suggestion from the gentleman from the audience was a good one. We should padlock that lower lot if that's not really being used by, check, look into it first. But oh, it, uh, it, it's just one gate that controls everything. This was, no, this was just a chain that for some time used to divide the lot into two. Uh, but but really trust me that wouldn't there work were, there were the same problems there when the chain no. was okay. I, I know well, that. The, the holes are still in the pavement okay for the poles okay and the chain could be reinstalled that's a yeah. no-brainer okay. and when that chain came down a lot of these problems started happening okay um, we have oh uh, Scott from Gomez sorry um, I, I also uh, agree I, I know that this is an, a regional problem but this is also a, um, a public taxpayer problem property here, here. as well and we I would like to see that the recommendation um, request that the Metro get something placed on the RTC on their agenda so that this can be brought up in their um, body of, of communication um, yeah, well, I, the chair and vice chair are here. We right. Know. Yeah. I think that's an no, no. put it on there. I, but it's, I agree. It, it's also it for official. the purpose of yeah. their staff resources since it falls under their auspice, even though there is a duplication of representation for both boards. 
and I, okay. I still feel that we need to have the patience since this is just newly discovered. Um, and I don't want to deter what we're doing to make it more efficient of uh, less, less uh, vehicles on the road with the, the carpooling um, capability that, um, that, they're, that they're doing. Um, I, I know that at Watsonville they're using uh, the, the shopping center parking lots and whatnot. And I, I, I couldn't tell you where there would be an, a large enough public space around. It's going to take some effort on the parts of um, looking that up. And um, so there's homework to be done, but I, I think it's an RTC homework, and let's make sure we let RTC know to get. So you're some offering resources. that as a, a does that uh, the Metro have a, a, a directive to have this notify. become a, a notify the yeah, RTC? It's a friendly amendment, a friendly amendment that's accepted by the maker and the second Absolutely. of that motion. Right. That. Yes. So we have two friendly amendments. Okay. Uh, friendly group. okay. Anybody <laughs> else have anything to say on this? Okay. Uh, the motion with two amendments. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered. Okay. Now we will. Um, move quickly we will to view two items to be discussed in closed session. Is there anything that's going to be reportable? Uh, yeah. We just have one case to discuss, and there will not be any report out. You guys okay. stay in, you need we'll to recess to closed session, but then uh, reconvene in open session to, to close it. But we. Uh, uh, the next meeting of the Metro Board is on November 16th at 9 a.m. at Watsonville. And Mr. Dutra, where is it when we want to tell you about tell you about it? It's, yeah. Okay. John, don't leave. We need. Uh, I, I, I think we have. I think. Do we still have a quorum?